Well, we also have other speakers of the day today. Um, Dr. Shrikala and Dr. Belu has also joined. So I'm sure uh, we're all set for the day. Um, Madam, uh, Disha, Madam, I think it's yeah. time. Should we? Sh we'll start. Uh, yeah, there yeah. are a few more faculty who will join. Uh, maybe they will join sooner. But I think it's uh, time. And I really want to value your time. So we should not keep you waiting. And there are many students yeah, also. Okay. So if you're fine, we will start another. Yeah, or you, if minutes. you want, we can wait, wait for a couple of minutes more. No, madam, it's OK. No problem. If you're comfortable, then we'll go back. 10 to <laughs> <laughs> I'll just um, start off by a few instructions, and then uh, yeah, okay, we can sure. start. Uh, Good morning to one and all joined, and we wish you have a great day today. Uh, I would like to put forward a few requests to the participants. One is that please keep your mics muted and also avoid presenting. Uh, so that would make the transmission better. And also, you know, we could all enjoy the uh, lectures. Thank you for that. Um, in addition, for all the participants, uh, uh, we would also uh, let you know that uh, there is a feedback form which we would uh, Posted by the end of the uh, webinar. So, all students who are interested to take a certificate or would like to give a feedback, uh, please uh, fill up the form and send it to us. After which, we can send you the certificate. Thank you for that. So, I think it's time for us to start the second day's webinar. Welcome, one and all, once again for this second day sessions of the webinar on responding to COVID-19 school education and its stakeholders, organized by the Department of Sociology, Pondicherry University. And this particular webinar is sponsored by Azim Premji University Research Grants. We had a very interesting set of presentations yesterday, which has also set the tempo for today's discussions. We also had a glimpse of the macro and micro issues. We will begin today's program with the second technical session. So we are straight away starting with the technical sessions. And we are delighted to have distinguished speakers today who are also who are very notable in the field of education. Today, for the first technical session, we have four speakers. And the sessions will be moderated by Dr. Imji Renla Longkumar. We will have uh, the first presentation by Professor Disha Navani, who is the Dean, School of Education, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, she will speak on COVID-19, schooling and child reflections. Her research lies uh, within the field, within the discipline of sociology, the sociology of education, and she has been a key member uh, and of um, several drafting committees and is also a um, serious reviewer and analyst of the various education policies and program. Her publications are very sharp and uh, provides the required critical views. The projects are largely evaluatory reports, and she is also the managing editor of Contemporary Education Dialogue by Sage Publications. And uh, she is an, also an expert advisor for various for framing various policies and implementation of the government policies. We are indeed very privileged and very happy that she has agreed to join us for this webinar and she would share her views today. Uh, I know she is a very, very busy person, but despite that, she has agreed. And uh, she has this uh, professional approach because she uh, took up the topic and she readily agreed. Um, you know, understanding, uh, you know, that we are in need of uh, an expert for this and, um, you know, her views really matter to us. Madam, thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to your presentation today. Uh, what I will do is I will also uh, 
uh, you know, give a brief uh, introduction about the other speakers as well and hand over the charge to Dr. M. T. Um, and the uh, next speaker of the day is uh, Dr. Shrikala, who is currently uh, working in the department in the School of Education as a faculty at Pondicherry University. Uh, she is also a very, very impressive uh, uh, researcher and teacher. Uh, she has uh, also a sociological orientation in teacher education. Uh, she is also a Humboldt Fellowship holder and works on the area of primary and secondary effects of so um, effects of social background inequality, social background and inequalities in accessing higher education in India. She also possesses strong collaborative links with international universities. Uh, she's an excellent teacher. And we are very thankful to her for accepting our invitation. Madam Srikala, thank you very much. And uh, she is one ready supporter for us. Um, when we are in uh, a requirement of a specialist in the area, she's always there to support us. And I remember her with gratitude for this. And we're happy that you join us here, Madam. Thank you very much. And we also look forward for your presentation eagerly. Um, we, uh, in addition uh, to the, uh, the academicians here, we also have uh, an independent researcher here who is also a very supportive person and uh, an expert in this area. We have with us here um, an impressive speaker who will speak on psychosocial insights for holistic well-being of learners and teacher teachers. This is Dr. Bellu, who holds a long academic uh, career in USA and India which includes uh, teaching, research, uh, scholarly writing, curriculum designing, uh, managing educational partnerships, and guiding research scholars. Um, she has also been working with us in the Center for Women's Studies, and we are very thankful to her for accepting our invitation. Uh, and uh, we know uh, Dr. Mera has received uh, you know, several uh, research grants and prestigious uh, scholarships for teaching excellence um, and, and her teaching uh, has been um, appreciated by most and she has been receiving awards for that and she's currently an independent researcher which has uh, but she has also worked with uh, Sri Aurobindo Center for Advanced Research and Sri Aurobindo Society. Uh, she paints her thoughts regularly through her um, articles in magazines and journals um, and we are again thankful to Dr. Belu because uh, she is again a very resourceful person and despite her uh, constant engagements she has agreed to be part of this program. Dr. Bailu, thank you very much and we look forward for your presentation. Um, in a, along with these speakers here we also have um, two set of uh, two uh, young scholars, young PhD scholars who are um, Shurbi, Shurbi Nagpal and Ankit Sharaf from uh, uh, Shirbi is from Tata Institute of Social Sciences and um, Ankit uh, Sharaf is from IAM. Uh, they are uh, research scholars and uh, they have done wonderful research um, in the field of education and uh, they are the ones who are on field who immediately, as soon as there was an issue, real researchers who had gone to the field, who had collected the information and reports and who would be speaking on uh, uh, the teaching workload, COVID and the teachers, teachers non-teaching workload, which I'm sure in yesterday's discussions also, it was over, over and over mentioned how the teachers, especially the private school teachers are being overloaded and it has also you know, led to several other um, consequences which are, uh, uh, which is not very welcome. So we uh, see that, you know, it's, it's time that we recognize all of that. So uh, they have done this substantial work and we look forward to listen to, uh, listening to them. Uh, welcome, Shurvi and Ankit, for this program. And uh, we really uh, you know, would uh, take your results very seriously and see how we can incorporate it. Thank you for joining. And um, all this sounds very interesting. So the speakers will speak uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, I'm sure the speakers would stick on to the time. And the session, this particular session will be moderated by Dr. M. Chirenla Longkumar. And she is our young faculty, a very, very supportive and eager faculty. We are very uh, thankful to her because any requirement, she's always there and with a very cheerful and a smiling face and the complete commitment. That is what we appreciate in her. And she is here to moderate and handle the session. 
uh, actually Dr. M. Chilen Lalangkumar teaches in the Department of Sociology, Pondicherry University, and uh, she is she has a doctorate from JNU University, uh, JNU, and um, she uh, specializes in the sociology of culture and many other areas as well. Uh, she is a very popular teacher among our students. And with a small introduction, I hand over the charge to Dr. M. T. Lala. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aruna, madam. Thank you so much. Good morning to you all. Uh, it's my pleasure indeed, indeed to uh, welcome all of you to this uh, second uh, day and second technical session. We have a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, very esteemed uh, panel of speakers today. And without uh, further ado, I think uh, without wasting much time, I would want to get into this. But before this, I want to make an announcement for the participants. If uh, you have any questions, please leave it in the chat box so that I can uh, take it up for the speakers after uh, they are done. Uh, shall we uh, finish all the presentations first and then take up the questions? Or uh, uh, should we go uh, one? Uh, than, uh, one speaker at a time. Dr. Imt, Madam. you can consult with the speakers and then you can decide uh, it's your choice and the okay. speaker's choice. Express. Yes, so uh, like uh, yesterday we had uh, some questions. So if uh, some of you have to uh, leave, etc., so we can always take, out, take up the questions individually as well. So uh, please uh, do let me know in the chat box if uh, we can take up. Okay, I uh, would want to hand over the, uh, uh, the, 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 the time to Professor uh, Tisha uh, Nawani. She is Dean, School of Education, uh, TIS. She will be speaking on uh, COVID-19, schooling and child reflection. Madam, I would hand over the time to you. Uh, good morning, everyone, especially Dr. Aruna. I find these uh, introductions rather embarrassing. But it's because of the warmth and the affection with which you called, and I'm, that's why I'm here. I don't know what the expectations are, because like in our university, we keep examining problems. And our students who are largely practitioners, they often tell us that, you know, we keep talking about problems and what are the solutions. So we keep telling them the solutions, they have to emerge from the context, and so it's important to examine the problem. So I don't know what the expectations are today, but I've written something on this, um, in this, uh, on this topic, and I'd like to share my views. I was also thinking that uh, had it been regular circumstances, I would have been in Pondicherry perhaps. But then I was also thinking if, if, if the COVID-19 hadn't happened, then this seminar on COVID-19 wouldn't have been organized, right? So, yeah. So basically, it's, um, it's like we all agree and we all have been experiencing, we never have experienced a situation when the entire world is engulfed by a pandemic. I mean, it's a really strange, bizarre situation that we find or, or find ourselves in. Where human life is under threat, plans are being mercilessly aborted. I mean, you plan something, you plan to travel or anything, nothing works. Um, all others are viewed with suspicion, even our friends and our neighbors and our like relatives and all of that. We, there's an element of mistrust which has kind of gotten between us. Everyone is grappling to make sense of the incomprehensible. Under these circumstances, human pride has also taken a considerable beating. Pride that we control our lives badly shaken, and that's really important. I don't know how many of you have seen the film uh, Parasite. Have you seen the film, the South Korean film Parasite? In this context, uh, this film appears to be strangely prophetic. It's set against the extreme class inequalities in South Korea. And the film beautifully captures the diametrically opposed world of two families. So there are two families, one is very rich and one is, the other is very poor. And the worlds are diametrically opposed to each other. Though the story is not unique to South Korea, but resonates with the concerns of people around the world. More so in India, where inequities of caste add another layer of separation, alienation, discrimination among people. So, so basically, um, uh, there's, there's this poor family which is trying to make inroads into the families of the rich, rich, rich family, and uh, and and their plans are all failing, and they're in a desperate, pathetic situation towards the end. And the son asks the father, "That what plan do we make next?" When nothing is working, so the father tells him that you know what kind of plan ever fails? No plan at all. You know, because why life cannot be planned. So emerging from, and it's very strange that the film came and at and, and the same time we're experiencing this kind of situation where we thought we are under control, but nothing seems to be under control. 
So emerging from a proletarian perspective, we can fully appreciate the sentiment when we see how thousands of migrant labor walking across hundreds of miles to escape an uncertain future made cruel by the apathy and neglect of our government and society. Although the virus is beyond caste, color, or class, it's hard not to notice the ways in which its effects are informed by social asymmetries of power and wealth. So even though the, the virus cut, cuts across all differences of caste and color and gender and age and what have you, the effects or the implications of the virus on people located in different social situations is quite different. It would also be naive to imagine that people across caste, gender, age, and religion would forget their differences and finally stand united in their fight against the pandemic. With the strange but intense aggression with which enemies are being identified, responsibility fixed, and victims ostracized. It's very strange that you have a situation in which, in which a virus is impacting the, hu the humanity, the every, everybody, nobody is left untouched, and yet you kind of you, you, you want to protect yourself and you want to discriminate yourself from the other, you want to separate or isolate yourself from the other. It's only in India that the virus has been deliberately communalized and a particular religious minority is being held responsible for its spread. And it's really unfortunate. In a political environment filled with intense hatred, strife, and unabashed, and unabashed, and unabashed divisiveness, one is constantly compelled to reflect on the kind of society we have created for ourselves. We also need to question the role played by education in promoting or questioning stereotypes and strengthening or dissipating social inequities and making us become the person that we are. Needless to say, this cannot be understood without examining the nature of the state and its politics and the way it uses, its, uses and manipulates education to fulfill its own objectives. So we are pretty aware when we talk about education, we have a layered, a hierarchized, a stratified society, and we also have a layered, hierarchized education system. And there's a perfect sync, unfortunately, between the layering of the social groups in society and the layering of the education system that we kind of attend, that we go to. So within, if you look at the, both the private schools and the public schools, there's a layering within both public and well as, as well as private. They, they, these are not homogeneous categories or groups. And depending on where you come from, you go to a school, depending on the social location that you kind of belong to. So moving on to education system, there are several challenges, but I've picked up a few in the context of what we are experiencing. And the pandemic urges us to reconsider our aims of education, which, are examine, which, which, which essentially are examine what is happening in schools in the name of education. What messages are being conveyed to children and teachers? How are these messages received by children and teachers belonging to different social locations? How much should one emphasize individual achievement vis-a-vis -vis cooperative learning? And in society, this is a bit dicey because we use individual achievement or marks, for instance, to allocate rewards. And, and in a society which is uh, constrained in terms of opportunities, this becomes important, therefore. Further, we also need to accord the renewed importance to certain ethical universals and rethink the relationship between state, education, and people and citizens. In short, this global crisis has provided us the opportunity to reflexively engage with the life worlds and the role of education therein. These concerns are, however, are hardly new, but have in fact featured as central points of discussion and reflection in several policy documents on education. It may not be completely erroneous to say that an inner pandemic Epidemic has been simmering in the form of learning crisis in India for quite some time, and yet we continue to do the exact opposite of what has been proposed. And I'm, by learning crisis, I don't mean the learning crisis which Pratham and the ASR report talks about, the children don't know literacy, basic literacy and uh, numeracy skills, but the fact that we have a differentiated education system for different people, that's what I'm also referring to, and what our curriculum is really trying to achieve, the way our the teaching learning resources are structured, and the kind of assessment system we follow. So despite the fact that we have a learning crisis of at, at multiple levels in, 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 and it's fairly multidimensional, and not, not just in terms of not being able to acquire teaching and learning literacy and numeracy skills, we pursue a curriculum that is alienating, celebrate a pedagogy which denies the agency of both teachers and students, and threaten our children to learn in order to avoid failure. I mean, you must be aware of the right to education. We talked about the no detention policy and the no, detention, no, the no detention policy was largely for uh, preventing dropouts of children, children who stayed back in school and because and, and, and when they failed and they were made to stay back in the class, they kind of dropped out of the school system because of humiliation. 
and we went right, and that was a very progressive measure, but we went right ahead, and we drew that uh, provision, saying the children are not learning. Unfortunately, children don't learn because of several things which are not in place in the school systems, and we wanted to be, we, we were very happy convenient and blaming children for not learning. And this whole idea of fear, that if children are afraid and they are fear, fear of not learning, fear of failing, fear of humiliation, all of that, and that's the reason why you kind of learn. One cannot ignore the complexity of the state in all this, as its community offers an education which is tailored to reproduce the existing inequalities in our society. And I've also written up something about it. For instance, we, like I said, right from the time we got independence, it's not that we had an equ equitable education system based on principles of equity and social justice. I mean, we had a system which was conveniently tailored or structured to meet the requirements of a divided society. So it's not that we went for a common school system. And often, uh, even though I've written a lot about the policy, the new education policy 2020, it also uh, sometimes wonder when people talk about the policy that this policy is violating the principles of equity and social justice. And I wonder, we've been doing that for years. I mean, the fact that we have a layered education system the fact that we have a non-formal education system, the fact that we have a education which we think is relevant for the poor or the potential dropouts or the children who are, have to work to support their parents. So we've had this for years. It's not that we've kind of suddenly gone into uh, uh, pr promoting privatization. Privatization also, for instance, is an old, it's since the 1990s and even earlier, we've, we've had the private sector playing a very important role. So, so COVID-19 grants us an opportunity, even if possible, to pause and reflect and perhaps reconsider what's happening inside our schools and universities in the name of education. And it's, it's not that uh, it's, it's this uh, COVID which kind of forces us to reflect on the kind of education system that we had. We had the NCF 2005, which also talked about the fact that the child and the teacher needs to be brought in the center of the education. And we need to move beyond uh, problems of communalization or saffronization, which are important and which need to be addressed and which need to be definitely critiqued. But we also need to think that we need to reflect on what's happening inside the schools and inside the classrooms, which force children to go remain out of school. Or the fact that the, what you're learning is not making sense to you. The fact that a lot is taught, but little is learned or understood. The fact that there's no joy in learning. So we've, unfortunately, we've had several problems at several levels for a long, long time, and people have been writing about it, and people have been looking at the problem, and people have also been suggesting solutions, but we never seem to take them seriously. So if there's no joy in learning, now there's so much of joy in learning that the jo process apparently becomes joyful, and you're smiling, and you're laughing, and you're all of that is doing activities, but there's no real learning happening. The fact that there should be joy of learning, and you're not joy in learning, that seems to have got a, kind of got misplaced. So rather than using this opportunity for introspection and reflection, all we seem to be concerned about is a mode of teaching to be adopted under the present regime of social distancing where students cannot physically access schools and colleges. And the, so so the, the most important concern which I find most people talking about is how do you reach out to children, how do you reach, reach out to students because they're not being able to come to schools and colleges and the, and the, the, the environment where all of them are huddled together and that's going to create further problems. That's our main concern. And as a response to the situation, our instrumental nationality has hit upon online teaching as a solution to this pandemic which prevents face-to-face -face learning to take place. Never mind the meaning and purpose of this education in staring hardy to find solutions gets reduced to delivering a certain content with the help of technology. And I've seen quite a few cases that we often tend to think in terms of binaries. So we have solutions in bipolar categories. So if there's a face-to-face -face teaching which is not possible now, Let's have an online teaching where students are reached, you reach out to students through technology. And, and quite a few, even before the pandemic actually, quite a few schools that have been kind of examining or learning systems, what they tend to do is they tend to replicate what is there in the textbook on a, on a, on a, on a, on a digitized platform. And they, that's what they teach. So the content gets kind of replicated in the slides and the technology takes over. The obsession with digital learning also aggravates the popular perception of pitching technology against the teacher, so much so that it's being thought of as even substituting a teacher. The technology and this whole discourse and has become so overwhelming that you actually think that the technology can also replace the teacher. It's been some time now that technology has made inroads in the teacher's lives, like tablets to record school-related data, gadgets to register biometric attendance, 
and CCTV cameras to monitor their movement. On the one hand, technology is seen as solving all problems related to non-learning of children and non-accountability of teachers, while on the other hand, passion in teachers is being promoted in the draft new education policy as a mantra for them to be successful. And even though I may be sounding like a devil's advocate, I have some views on this whole idea of passion. For instance, this whole idea of passion is really propagated now if you go for teacher education, if you go for that meeting on teacher education or teachers, or even the policy talks about the fact that teachers, people with passion should get into the profession of teaching. And that to me is a problem from two points of view, two, 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 uh, two, two aspects. One is that how do you really measure passion? I mean, you say the teachers need to be passionate. Those people with passion, they can, they can do a good job. So how do you really measure passion? And most of the time I've seen that people try and um, express socially desirable answers, the answers which may will make them, will make the interview, for instance, in a situation where you're trying to get admitted to a teacher education program, that I'm passionate about teaching and I love children and I've, I've taught this, this one, that one, and so on and so forth. So you try and express, you try and show that you're really passionate because you, there's no concrete um, evaluator of passion, right? So you try and say that you're really passionate about teaching, you love children, and you've been dying to teach and so on and so forth. So how do you really measure passion? And the policy says that in demonstration interviews, which again is a problem because you, you, can't, you can't measure passion by, in these ways. And the second idea, the second reason which I, which I, which I kind of point, point out why passion is problematic is I feel passion is something which everyone needs to have. Everyone needs to be passionate about whatever they're doing. So if you're a teacher or a principal or a student or a wife or a mother, whatever, you need to have passion. But unfortunately, in our country for quite some time, this word passion or this idea of passion is being used to individualize structural problems. So if there are structural problems out there, there are huge numbers of students in your class, that's okay. You, you, you be passionate. You go ahead with your passion. Or if they don't have a regular salary or a regular job or the service conditions are very threatening, then you, you continue to work with passion. And that to me is a problem because you don't repair or address the structural problems outside of the teacher, but you kind of pile on to the teacher entirely and, individual, and say that this is your individual problem. You need to do this, that, and the other, and you need to be passionate. So such a position of the state makes issues such as reasonable salary, appropriate working conditions, and even good training for teachers are done. So people think that's a noble profession, and you, need, you don't need to worry about the basic requirements which other people worry about. That, to me, is a problem. I would also like to highlight two interrelated concerns here. Without underestimating the emancipatory potential of education, we must also not expect education alone to bring about social change. And again, this is, I'm playing the devil's advocate. Education has huge potential to do this, that, and the other. But education alone cannot transform society. For meaningful education to take place, facilitated processes such as, such as curriculum where students can connect with, a pedagogy which is inclusive, an assessment which supports student learning, etc., need to be placed. Besides that, equally important are factors beyond the control of the teacher, such as teacher pupil ratio, service conditions, and adequate infrastructure. But more importantly, education cannot remove structural inequities among people. It may enable students to question, to raise their voice, to protest, etc., but it cannot claim to do what the state is empowered and equipped to do. For example, a teacher cannot be expected to practice a constructivist pedagogy if there are 100 and 200 students in a class. So you, you have to create a conducive environment for the teacher to be able to function optimally. Similarly, expecting children to bathe, before, bathe daily before coming to school will not be possible if they do not have access to even basic drinking water. So what I'm trying to say is that education can lead to social change, can empower people, can bring about social transformation, and this, that, and the other. But education alone cannot do things which the state also must be doing. So if there's no water in my house to even drink, I can't be expected to, like, you know, being taught the importance of having a bath in my life is not really going to help too much. I need to have access to housing, proper housing. I need to have access to water. I need to have access to schooling and so on and so forth. Moreover, it, um, moreover, it needs to be reiterated that neither technology nor teachers act autonomously but function in a certain context where several extraneous factors impact their effectiveness. Just as a teacher needs to be trained and supported, technology needs to be used with greater caution, sensitivity, and reflection. And along passion, uh, the other side of passion is the idea of teacher education, which again, everyone keeps talking about how important teacher education is. 
and there's no denying the fact that teacher education has an important role to play. I mean, no, you can't deny the importance of a good teacher education program. But that, again, if it's kind of overstretched, could lead to problems because then you're saying that, okay, so if you have, if you go to a good teacher education program, you can be a wonderful teacher and you can, you can create magic in the class, which again is a problem because a teacher education program also has an important role to play, but the teacher must also be supportive and a uh, facilitator environment needs to be created around her where she can actually uh, do a wonderful job. So if, you're, if you have an assessment system which is based in rote memorization, even if a student goes through a fantastic teacher education program, she'll be forced to transact the textbook in the classroom, right? So all these things are kind of interlinked with each other. And uh, it's more often than not, it's seen as quick fixes, cost-effective solutions in the name of alternatives are reserved for disadvantaged sections of society, whether it is they who need greater attention and individualized support. Uh, and the idea uh, that the disadvantage, you use technology or whatever, for disadvantaged sections, it's they who need much more support, much more hand hand holding, and we kind of we often in the policies we often construct low cost alternatives for these children. So, for instance, if you look at the 1980s policy, we talked about non formal education, and non on for non formal education was proposed as a brilliant idea to reach out to children who were either child labor or girls who had to stay back at home to take care of their siblings or children who are likely to drop out, right? So the idea of relevance got created. And he said that if you give them a relevant ed an education which is relevant to them, which makes sense to them, which whereby where, where the curriculum that they go through relates to the life of a bit of folk songs and uh, they're taught by teachers who are from the community who may not be trained and qualified. So the idea of relevance to me is also very problematic. Even though it looks, it sounds good, it looks good, and we often say that we should have a relevant education which makes sense to us. But the idea of relevance has also been used in the context of poor children to give them an education which is limited and constrained by where they come from. So the potential, you put a ceiling on the potential, you put a cap on the potential, that this is what you're, this is what, this is what you like to do in life, and this is the kind of education that you need. Whereas most of us who continue to go to formal schooling, in spite of the fact there are huge problems in the formal schooling system, we go through the grind, whether it makes sense to us or not. And one must recognize the environment that one grows in, structures one's experiences, frames one's choices, and determines opportunities and successes and failures in life. Therefore, any analysis of education achievement or performance of individual, community, etc., must take cognizance of the diverse context in which they're situated without either glorifying, dismissing, or blaming it. So the education system has been struggling with several challenges for a long, long time in terms of the curriculum, in terms of pedagogy, in terms of teacher education programs, in terms of assessments, and we've been, uh, it's been our hallmark that we kind of create, a we form a committee to look into problems, and then once the committee gives us solutions to the existing problem, we form another committee which counters the suggestions of the former committee. So yeah, it's a time to really reflect that what we really are doing and how this makes us, how this should make us think, rethink, or reflect on the kind of education that we are giving to children, the way we treat our children, uh, whether we treat them equally or not. For instance, you have these low-cost schools, which are now being promoted as being like wonderful solutions to the, the fact that government school children are, learn, are not learning. So you have these reports which are constantly shaming the government school children and saying that these children are not learning. So for them, we have a low-cost private school where you, you have teachers who are employed on contractual basis, where you give them very little salaries, where there's constant threat that they'll be thrown out anytime the students don't perform. And, and, and the fact that, and I'll end with this, I think I've taken more time, and the fact that the uh, right to education talks about certain uh, basic prerequisites to be in place for a school to function, and the low-cost private lobby guns for these uh, kind of provisions, or says that we are not being allowed to do our own work, that to me is a problem. So there are a huge number of problems, unfortunately, and uh, this, this should have actually enabled us to reflect and rethink about what we're doing with our children in our schools, through our textbooks, through the assessment system that we follow. Uh, yeah, so I think I'll end here. I think I've taken more time. No problem, uh, Professor. It was it was a very uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I would uh, go to that later. I mean, I, because I want to uh, first give uh, everybody the chance to speak, and then we will pick up uh, questions.
for everyone. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Madam uh, Professor you. Professor Navani. Thank you so much. Yes. So uh, the next speaker we have is uh, our uh, colleague from here, a very good friend also. Um, I want to invite uh, Dr. Srikala to uh, speak on uh, the topic mitigating whitening inequality in learning opportunities during COVID-19. Use of supplementary pedagogy in schooling. So please, madam, please take your time. Thank you, Dr. Lutti. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Let me thank the university and uh, the Department of Sociology and especially the organizer of the webinar, Dr. Aruna, a good friend of mine, uh, for giving me a chance to talk about uh, an issue which is not discussed much uh, let me also concurrently try to present this. Just a minute. I have a PowerPoint presentation. Right? Let's try. Let's see a minute. Yes. Uh, is it visible to you? Yes. Uh, is it visible to you? It's Sorry. visible. It's visible. It's visible now. Yes. Uh, okay, if you want to see me uh, on the screen fully, please fill me up. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, this is the talk. Uh, the talk is, let me tell you the purpose of the talk, how I have arranged it. Uh, as uh, Professor Navani said, there are a lot of issues, and if you ask about solutions, I also do not have a solution, but that doesn't mean, you know, we didn't work towards finding some solutions. So I think uh, the purpose of the talk uh, of today, I would try to present or try to provoke a discussion of inequality in education during these times. Uh, there have been actually till yesterday, I was giving lectures on how to use technology efficiently, especially in blended learning. I'm so happy I get to talk about uh, something, uh, a talk, an area where I have passion. Um, so there are uh, people talk about many things when it comes to pandemic. And the entire talk mostly is focused on technology. Very little talk is going on about or discussion is going on about the impact of these school closures on uh, the poor children, on the children who are marginalized, especially children who are studying in, um, I don't want to say government schools again, as uh, Professor Nawani said, it is, uh, it's a little difficult actually. But then uh, I should say the marginalized and the deprived in this country, the number is so high, we already have a lot of problems to solve. Because these problems are not anything new to us, but then this would have definitely heightened due to the present situation. This had, this is what the studies say. I would cite uh, certain studies during the course of showing you uh, the uh, slides. Have some of them, collect some of them. Uh, now, what I feel is, in all our discussions uh, about how to implement uh, kind of pedagogies, different pedagogies for reaching the students to a maximum extent, we probably tend to overlook something called the core activity of the educational experience. I'm not talking about learning, I'm not talking about teaching, I'm not talking about education, I talk about the experience. You see, as a teacher, when I teach, I have an experience. Uh, when a student actually learns, the student has an experience which is called learning experience. So how is this core of activity managed? Probably we are unable to do a lot in this area. This is where inequalities can easily creep into if we do not take care of this. Uh, now, there is a, there are some kind of complexities. When I say complexities, these complexities arise. This is already there, as uh, Professor already told us in the first session. A very nice presentation. I liked it. A lot of information she has conveyed um, in half an hour. So uh, these, the complexities are already existing. Now, some complexities would have definitely, uh, new complexities would have arisen due to the present situation. I don't know whether I could make this comparison. I'm just wondering, uh, probably a great change in pedagogies, great change in 
learning uh, management should happen. Uh, you know, whenever we have such such that kind of an upheaval probably wouldn't have happened. Maybe after the you know World War, or, may not be good to make that kind of comparisons. But then still, we had new theories, uh, new approaches, new pedagogies. Uh, why not? Maybe we will have to think about such kind of pedagogies uh, to meet the challenge. You know, especially when the children come back to the school, or even now, about how to reach them somehow. This is what is called deconstructing the complexities. This I will discuss um, in the duration of the talk. Uh, this is this uh, deconstruction of these complex pieces to give a better experience for them to learn. Uh, now, we would also I would also just touch upon within the time that is given to me. Yeah. So uh, there is a need for introducing what is called pedagogies for the changed times, right? So these pedagogies, when I talk about pedagogies, this is not anything new. This has we have been using it. Uh, uh, not very as very prevalent. Uh, maybe we will have to reintroduce some of them or go and look the pedagogies. A lot of them existing uh, in education. People will know this. But then, which we would reintroduce? What kind of combinations we are making? What kind of theories that we are going to uh, reintroduce? This we have to see. Um, right. Uh, let me just uh, very fast tell you about. I don't need to uh, tell you how to how do we learn. Most of you are, you know this, but then still this is very interesting to me. So I'm just sharing. There are people from education here. They would also find this very interesting. Uh, we have the, these two dichotomous uh, nature of learning. You know? If you know a little bit of psychology, you would know this. There is at one side we have behaviorists. They would always say, you know, the learners when you give a stimuli and the uh, human beings would give a response to the stimuli and and these responses, due to these responses, learning happened. This is what behavior is saying. And at the same time, we have an, at another end, at the other extreme end, we have something called populativism and constructivism, wherein we believe probably these responses to stimuli do not work so much. We have to mentally process these stimuli that we get, and we work on this stimuli. This is this is to polarize to dichotomized nature of learning. These are the two views. You know, we are very much used to this. And if uh, somebody, uh, if one of you asks me uh, which is good or which is uh, uh, more uh, practical, I would run away. I would escape from here because uh, I'm, I, st I always keep thinking about this. But my understanding is maybe at different situations, different theories would work. Now, uh, altogether, there is a change of relationship of individual brain to the social context because of the pandemic. Because, because we are cut off. Yesterday, our director was saying I liked it. We uh, want to maintain a distance at the same time, we want to connect. I don't know how many brains would adapt to this, especially the kids. Uh, you know, we have a tendency to think about higher education because we are working over there. But the maximum I have tried to uh, reach up to the schooling. So I do not know how individualized, how much children can relate, at least like us. So this would have definitely weakened this kind of an old debate. So now, how do we tackle this situation? We could, we could at least think about, we could at least discuss how we are going to tackle um, the theories, how we are going to tackle with this um, new management, learning management systems, you know, the kids are back, or even now, we do not know, this is a very uncertain situation, even now when we are trying to reach out to them. So, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, it's even a little difficult for me, I'm trying to bring the threat of inequality here. So, when this new understandings and new knowledge of pedagogy comes, uh, if we do not discuss properly about the inequalities that can easily creep into this kind of situation, uh, we have to take care of it. So this is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, I am not going to say that we are not doing anything. We are teachers. Most of us are teachers. We know the kind of struggle that we are going through. Parents, you would have already discussed, unfortunately, some of the sessions I missed because of other problems. So the parents, the whole teaching learning process has fallen on us. Especially the privileged, I should say, may not be the poor, marginalized children, especially in the rural areas. They must all be working. They may not be focusing. This is a this is a big issue wherein you know a lot of inequalities would have come already. A lot of divide would have happened. Uh, you had already discussed about that, I know. And we are all working on how to manage this process of learning. But at the same time, let's be very careful that we we know what kind of uh, educational experience are given to the children uh, because. Uh, Professor Navani was very rightly uh, pointing out uh, the different kind of uh, learning experience that we can show you or an interview with our 
children. Um, you know, giving substandard education to some children, uh, especially you know, that, that's very uh, a piece that would go to the marginalized always. It's a big problem that we face in this country. The, the extent of inequalities are very, very high, especially when it comes to access to education. All is fine. Am I audible? <laughs> because I do not see people. Everything is fine, Imti. Shall I go ahead? Yes, yes, you are you are me? Me. yes, yeah. yes. Fine. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, let's go. Let's very fast, quick look at uh, some reality check with the Boyd Band report. Mm, we would also uh, see the actual realities uh, from the ground. These people from Peace will know. I admire the kind of uh, ground work they do on education. So uh, let me uh, just uh, show you this slide, please. It is Savedra writing for the World Bank now in 2020 says, We are already on a global learning crisis. We already do not have many children in schools, and the statistics I really do not know very controversial. Many reports say many different kinds of, many different kinds of statistics. Uh, we were already not, our children were already not learning the fundamental skills needed for life, especially from the low and middle income class countries. And we, we, you also know about this learning poverty indicator. We have something called a learning poverty indicator, wherein uh, the report says um, at age 10, the children, 53 percentage of children, stood could not read and understand at the age of 10, especially in these middle income and low income countries, even before the outbreak started. And the report says the pandemic would have definitely it had the potential to uh, worsen these uh, situations uh, if we do not act. See, if we do not act, there are not many solutions, but then still, as teachers, as different stakeholders, especially NGOs and people who uh, philanthropic organizations, we can do our little bit. Um, of course, you know, education cannot do much when the state is not supporting us, but that doesn't mean we do not do things, especially the universities and different institutes. We could do certain, we can do certain, uh, we can make some changes. Um, there's no doubt about it. Now, now uh, I would also say it's not, the situation has not all been that bad. There are, there is, there are good responses uh, to COVID-19 from the universities, from the school teachers, especially close to them. Um, even the government school teachers, some experiences I would share uh, very quickly. So the innovations and responses to COVID-19 has been good. So there are some, again, there is a report of the um, OECD report, you know, the Rhymes and the Schleicher's uh, survey. It's very nice. Survey report is very good. So they have the um, collected data from 159 countries. India is one respondent country, uh, wherein there is a good number of responses uh, from India. Uh, like they discuss very few things I have written down. Uh, so there are the, this kind of virtual meeting places in Italy. One thing I liked in Africa, this is not for uh, school, primary school children. This is for uh, you, higher education. What they did is they have a global positioning system intervention wherein they are locating all children, all students who are registered at all public systems like universities, colleges, libraries, post offices, museums. Uh, this is accessing them. I like this method of accessing uh, students. For school children, it would be difficult. Just I'm sharing this for higher education. So uh, this is in order to facilitate access of students at their conveniently most located places. So this we could also take this kind of an idea of where are the locations where children are located and reach up to them. If they are not coming to us, how do we reach up to them to the maximum extent that is possible to us? Um, in this regard, just I wanted to share, other states are also, also must be doing this. I'm not very well aware of it. I didn't do a research on it. Uh, a student of me, a research scholar from UP was telling me that he knows that the, uh, school teachers have been going to the to different debating places. Maybe this is also an experience. I have been, you know, accidentally browsing onto some channels, uh, Malayalam channels, uh, which I have on my TV. And there is a program called First Bell Program. You must be knowing this. Uh, they are doing it through their educational channels of state government of Kerala, doing kite and uh, versatile ICT enabled resource for students, victors. This is not anything new. Our Kalam sir has inaugurated this in uh, 2005, I remember. They're using this now very effectively. Um, so this is uh, very successful. And the classes are very nice, especially the primary school primary children, I love some of the classes, especially on music. And uh, you know, the way the teachers are preparing on the uh, uh, stories and uh, it's nice. For me, it was very good. I keep watching uh, the evening programs at five o'clock for 10th standard, 12th and all. It's nice, the demonstrators, it's, it's going good. But then the question is how many people have 
uh, television sets. People must be having television sets, but uh, we should know our country, and there are many places, a very high percentage of people in this country do not get electricity continuously even for two hours. So this is very problematic. Uh, but probably the situation in Kerala is not that bad, but then still we had a student taking her life and then the uh, government was very alert. And then they came up with this proposal of neighborhood study centers. Mm, uh, so wherein, you know, they will have uh, at, uh, the neighborhood of uh, children where they are located. There would be a TV and uh, they could go there and sit and listen to the broadcast lessons, which is nice. So instead of uh, depending, you cannot expect the children to learn from uh, online classes. This is just a cup of tea for very few, very few in our country. It's very problematic. So uh, another culture that they have brought in is, maybe this is my feeling, a classroom at home. Probably the cereals and everything has been switched off. And all the, I, I understand from children that, you know, even their parents are sitting and watching uh, first bell with them. This is nice, a new culture of uh, e-learning. Uh, then let us see another ground level uh, reality check. The just people would definitely know this. Uh, uh, ILO, International Labour Organization 2020, there's another survey. They have also talked to uh, people, the government, uh, schools, teachers, and everyone, and they informally and unofficially there are reports of large number of children, in, especially in the uh, low income developing countries and uh, on the streets. So it's, it's very sad that a section of some uh, most of the children, some children are learning the privileged is getting some kind of education but most of them the underprivileged are working on the streets helping their parents girls must have already got married off many for reducing the responsibilities of children elder children must be helping in households very very uh, difficult situation right so now uh, uh, right uh, this is uh, about the deconstructing complexity this which i have shown you in the in the beginning of uh, the discussion. Um, I like this. Uh, probably this is something uh, which we have to uh, think deeply when we are talking about uh, decreasing at least the extent of inequalities that can happen. We don't have a solution for that as of now. Uh, see how this is a little bit uh, deeper uh, sociology. How we look at uh, children as a homogenized group. How we normalize or normalize this middle, middle class sensitivity that uh, uh, the children bring to classes. We have a tendency to look at children. We have a tendency to think that all children who come to the class are from middle class. Of course, we, we don't have to talk much about the higher class. They actually do not get so much of help from us. But the lower class, that, is, that should be a one uh, of concern to us. So we think that you know they all come from the middle class sensibilities and the education that suits them, which is very, very highly problematic. And in the new situation, this can become much more problematic. So uh, this homogenized uh, learning, uh, this is a uh, complexity. This is a complex, uh, you know, it is difficult. I understand it's difficult to consider individual um, learning, individual differences. But then we will have to consider these individual differences to, to any extent that is possible. Children do come and present in front of us the wonders of uh, their uh, inequalities, which has to be taken care of. Uh, instead of having a fixed understanding or a norm-based uh, understanding about the race, class, gender, backgrounds, language, sex, sexual origin, their abilities, religion, and many others, interestingly, in India. So this is uh, uh, the complexity that I have mentioned in the beginning, uh, going by a very norm-structured model, uh, which, which can fail us. Um, so this can also become a very potential injustice. Um, it, Reaching the year, I know when we come back to the school and when we go back to the universities, uh, of course, we are there, but now it is online. Uh, everybody talks about saving the year. This is salvaging the year. This is the meaning of salvaging that when something great, something bad has happened, uh, you have to save it. So, I don't know whether this saving the year is so much important than your learning experiences. Uh, is completing the curriculum so important now uh, if the children are not learning? Uh, so, what are we going to do about this? Uh, the, uh, the passion of uh, teaching and learning that we have just heard. It's a great concept in teacher education. Uh, this is what we call as virtues of learning. See, there is a, we will have to defend and cultivate these virtues of learning. We will have to do it. We will have to see that some the learning has happened. Learning is happening. There is participation from the uh, children. They experience what they get. So this. Uh, this is very important when you consider these issues of inequality. 
Uh, now, uh, this is exactly what I already said. The cognitive justice has to be taken care of or has to be provided to all children in the classroom to an extent possible individual learning is very important. The price that we can give to the most individual learning. Right. So let me very quickly also look at this uh, very important issue of online learning or remote learning in India, which is very problematic. This is one major factor that has brought very great extent of inequality or divide between people in this country. Uh, it is very successful only with the privileged. Uh, we know this. They have electricity. Uh, massive in inequality can creep into because of uh, uh, availability of internet, laptops, and mobiles for the rich people, which is not available in rural areas. Um, those who access have the opportunities. They take advantage of all the uh, provisions that the government is giving, all the programs that the government is giving. Uh, this is uh, a matter of uh, concern. This is something that all of us should feel bad about um, and think about what alternatives can be thought about. Uh, now, this uh, uh, technology capital, there's something called, uh, I don't know, Madam was talking about the social capital yesterday. Definitely, there's a great influence of social capital on accessing education. At the same time, maybe one more new dimension that has been added to social capital is ICT social capital. A student of mine has uh, done a PhD on this. So, lack of this also would have deepened the divide. Um, actually, the UN agencies, at least two of them, have warned against this uh, online education even before the pandemic has started. Uh, studies, the result of studies of OECD and the UN has done very clearly shows that uh, socioeconomic divide can deepen in virtual classes can leave students deprived of an education. And another group of people which we are not discussing much about is children with physical abilities. I do not know how much of learning is happening with them. How, I don't know how many of them can access assistive technologies. If they have assistive technologies, it's easy for them to access. Uh, and this access to assist, assistive technology is also very, a very difficult uh, factor uh, to which uh, uh, demands a discussion. Uh, this is uh, very much disturbing. It must be very disturbing to everyone. Uh, children, what has happened uh, during this closure of school is, at least even when there was uh, learning poverty, even when we were do not doing so great, we are not doing so great in schools. Uh, so, but then there was something called, you know, that there was a tree, which is called the school tree. There was a tree which is called teachers. There was a shade which is called shade. There was a shade, the teacher shade, which was very good for children, especially the marginalized. They had food in the school. They had nutrition in the school. Uh, you know, they could uh, save themselves from uh, different kinds of abuses, uh, you know, domestic violence, and many issues when they were in school. This is probably gone. Mm -hmm. It's very disturbing. I really do not know how much of uh, psychological pain they would be uh, coming back with, uh, what kind of traumas, long travels, and uh, the disturbances that their parents have. They must be carrying all these things. So, uh, I think we have already talked about this uh, slide. Please have a look at this. Uh, they need a. They will take. Uh, they will take some time to heal. There's such a vast divide between uh, these two groups of children, especially because you, you have already discussed about parental involvement. The factor that will create a lot of uh, divide, a lot of inequalities. Privileged parents do take care of this, their children because it's not easy to uh, control the pace of learning now that's happening with the children wherein they will have to take individual attention. Uh, now, very fast to this, uh, I don't know that I'm running short of time. I, I, I would go very fast, very few slides more, three or four. Uh, supplementary pedagogies, uh, I don't have many solutions, but then whatever I found, uh, some people use and but I think certain, based on my uh, experiences as a teacher, certain things can we can do at least, we can, we can go with a plan to be schools back, or even now we can uh, use it. Uh, we will not be running through this curriculum, finishing this curriculum, or, or our job may not be to uh, somehow to get back the year that has been lost. But then what is very important is a healing process that should go with the children. And then arranging for, or, a, or thinking of a well-planned teacher-based, you know, the teacher can be free, free with this, you don't have to go by the state, but the state is, many states are already planning this. A well-designed accelerated learning program, which is not totally based on the subject, which is a very composite or, or uh, program with the, Many dimensions of teaching and learning are uh, included in it. And it very, what's very important is involving the NGOs, uh, philanthropic organizations, many other organizations, individuals who are interested, students, anybody who is interested to uh, help us 
um, should be given away to you know come into the system of the schooling. Midday means uh, I heard that from different state people that alternative arrangements have been made by the government to bring the midday meal to the parents and children. At least in some states, I know in Kerala this is happening. I heard from the children. Uh, there are they also I know set of uh, teachers have also been visiting children in different places to conduct uh, small tests and examinations to help them to uh, keep motivated to studies at least. Um, right. Uh, so this uh, challenge. Self student directed learning is very difficult. You know, the, the uh, I keep uh, noticing uh, when the teachers take classes, their focus is on to check whether the children are in front of the camera when online uh, classes are going on and in front of TV. You never know what, what channel they are watching, it's all very difficult. So, this challenge is how are we going to meet this uh, challenge if they are doing online taking online classes? Uh, the self regulation from the side of the children, uh, one factor. Uh, that I want to focus is support of the teachers, supporting the school teachers especially. They need a lot of support, you know, most of them, for most of them it's a new experience of giving online education. Even broadcasters, I, I find them, you know, they find it very difficult standing in front of the camera in the TV station and uh, talk. A lot of support is to be given to them through using whatever possible technologies, not only technologies, also regarding uh, other learning resources have to be made easily available to them. A uh, lot of uh, support uh, regarding the quality assured, the curriculum materials, the same. Uh, types are required for this. You know, the universities and universities have to come uh, to the help, uh, help of uh, schooling, uh, school teachers now. This is the time actually. Uh, and also an understanding that the role of teacher doesn't diminish even at this difficult time. Uh, it's actually very important, very you know, crucial time to steer the student learning, especially now. Um, now, this model, if you just uh, Google OECD guidelines or frameworks for um, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, these models are available. Um, if you are interested, please go through this. I have not taken all some points which I, I thought India has discussed. It was good. Now, this uh, something which always disturbs me is this, uh, you know, this dichotomy of student centered learning and the teacher centered learning. Uh, I, I don't know what is wrong with teacher centered learning of direct instruction. Direct instruction is many times required for passing on information. There's nothing wrong in that. So there's a, there was a uh, OECD guideline wherein a researcher has uh, forgotten me. A researcher has uh, done come up with a model of a combination of student centered and teacher centered uh, model of teaching, uh, wherein you know the teachers uh, content knowledge is very important. Direct instruction including the explanation at the same time how you can engage the students highly in the, their own learning. Of course, I, I will not, uh, I probably have talked so much about inequalities when we are using online learning. That doesn't mean that we didn't use it, but then we can use several types of, uh, several technologies we can use to reach up to the students. Maybe radio, uh, TV broadcasting, different online learning if the state can uh, provide it, and the remote teaching activities can be designed in ways of uh, maximizing cognitive engagement and, and there is the risk of passivity from the part of the learning which has to be taken care of um, and students there are many activities that uh, teachers actually have been doing great work in schools so I find them encouraging uh, using many many different tricks actually to, to evaluate uh, making the students evaluate their own work somehow to make the students participate in their learning uh, 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 this would be my final slide I don't think anything after this yet. Uh, so just a very fast uh, highlight of what I have talked about, just to remind you about how important uh, inequalities are. Uh, please look at the slide. Mm -hmm. I do think education, what we have been doing is, was actually education through online learning. Uh, we have to think about this, whether this is actual education. Or uh, I have a feeling you know, uh, this, we were only trying to stop the gap or filling the gap, somehow managing to fill the gaps uh, and motivate the children and help them to come back. You know, this smooth transition has been planned, I believe. Salvaging the year or salvaging the learning? This question we want to ask. And uh, if we complete the curriculum or focus on actual planned learning? Uh, and when this new understanding and new knowledge about the learning theories and how learning happens, how do we handle the learning quality indicators that we have deepened definitely by now? How do you handle the complexities of stark differences? Uh, how do you focus on 
both the direct instruction and the student interaction together. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I end the presentation. Thank you, thank you. Uh... Dr. Srikala, thank you for that very passionate presentation. Um, we move uh, on to the next presenter, um, Dr. Belu Mehra, who is an independent researcher and writer. She will be... Can you hear me? Yes, I, yes, yes, I also have some... Uh, Glitches here, yes. So uh, she will be speaking on uh, the topic psycho spiritual insights for holistic well being of learners and teachers. So uh, please, madam, I give you uh, the time now. Thank you. Namaste, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, please let me know in case uh, any technical glitch comes up. I will reorient. So first of all, thank you so much, Aruna and Dr. Mohanty. Namaste, and uh, for inviting me and sharing some thoughts on this very important topic on how do we respond to this uh, unprecedented situation that we are all confronted with, not only in India, but um, the entire world. So I have um, heard lots of, uh, I mean, in, wonderful, valuable insights from various sessions yesterday and today. And I think I'm going to just uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, make us think about education a little differently. We continue to think of the problem in the same way that we have been thinking of um, how much opportunity there may be to totally be ready for the post COVID world that we will eventually have. So my thoughts, some of the insights and thoughts that I would share would be somewhat from coming from a little different perspective, maybe a little inner dimension to the purpose of education itself, because that is one thing that I believe often gets missed out on a lot of deliberations that happen in the context of challenges that we face um, in education, especially in this uh, particular context of how this, uh, how to address the COVID-19 situation in the context of education and the various stakeholders in education. So I would like us to just rethink a little bit in terms of the purpose of education. And I think it's very interesting when we think about it, the timing of the new education 2020, that the fact that it came in the middle of this um, pandemic situation, there is some uh, deeper, I believe there is some deeper purpose as to uh, the um, the push that we as a society, we as a nation should be understanding in terms of getting sort of out of the box in terms of our thinking of the aims and purpose of education itself. So let me begin with, first of all, a short story. And hopefully that story will convey what I am trying to propose in terms of what can be some of the insights um, that we can take for the holistic education, holistic well-being um, of learners and teachers as well. So the story is a very ancient story from Indian tradition. It's from one of the very old Upanishads in the uh, fifth Adhyay of Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And the story goes that once upon a time, um, the three groups of people, the three groups of beings go to the person whom we the, go to the being named as Prajapati, who is supposed to be the uh, maintainer of the cosmic order, the creator of the ordered creation in this entire existence. So the three types of beings who approach this Prajapati are the ones that are in the tradition called as the devas, those who are of the divine personality, the divine beings. Then the uh, manushyas, the human beings, and then the dhanavas or the asuras, those with whom we can simply in English refer to as the demoniac beings. So they three go to this man named Mr. Prajapati and say, okay, we want to stay with you for some time and can you teach us something? 
So he says, sure, come, just stay with me and we'll see how the teaching continues. So some time passes, there is no instruction. Um, but after a while, all the three gather together, you know, they pick their representatives and they say, well, we have spent three, uh, two, two years, three years. What about our education? What about our learning? So Mr. Prajapati tells them one syllable. He says, da. Um, and then he kind of, you know, in a mischievous, humorous way, listens, uh, looks at all the three groups of people sitting in front of him and he says, have you understood? So first comes the representative from the devas, the divine beings. And he says, yeah, I think we have understood what this syllable the means. It means dhammyata. In English, that would mean to be self-controlled. He says, yes. Prajapati says, yes, you've understood. Good, your education is complete. Then comes the next category of people, the manushyas, the human beings. So they also have received the same instruction, da. So the Prajapati says, have you understood what this means? So their representative, their class rep says, yes, I think we have understood. And da means datta. Be generous, be charitable, be giving. So Mr. Prajapati says, yes, you have understood. Well done. You have graduated. And then the third group of categories, the third class um, of people, the demoniac beings, the demons, they send their representative and they also have the same instruction, the, have you understood what the means? Yes, we have understood, sir. What does it mean? Da means dayadvam, be compassionate. So Mr. Prajapati says, you too have graduated. So you have also got what I wanted to convey to you. Now, what is this da? Da is the sound that the thunder makes when it does its job. Da, 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 da. So da, da, da. In one syllable, Mr. Prajapati gave three kinds of beings the lesson, the deeper lesson they needed to be for the gods, for the divine beings, those who have attained some deeper qualities in there to be um, self-controlled so that they will not become overly egoistic in who they are and that they won't be captivated by the splendors, by the riches that they have attained, intellectual, spiritual, psychological, material riches that they have obtained. For the human beings who are aspiring souls, the lesson is to be generous, to be charitable, to be giving, to be giving of oneself because it is through generosity we expand in our own consciousness. Otherwise, we stay limited by the limitations of our up parts of our being. Um, and to the demoniac beings, to the demons, to the asuras, the lesson is to be compassionate, to be daya, dayalu, daya, dayadvam. Now, the lesson of the story is that it's not that these are three separate beings or three separate classes, but that all these parts live within each individual. So for the div divine part in us, we have to learn the art of self-control, self-mastery. For the human part in us, we have to continue to practice generosity, charity, self-giving, to rise out of our own constructive, limited nature. And for the demoniac part of it, uh, in us, we have to constantly be compassionate. So this, with one little story, we can go on and understanding the deeper dimension of education, the deeper purpose of education. Another way to look at this story could be that within each individual, this is the truth of the nature that we often ignore in education. Within each individual, there exists light and shadow. There exists whatever the true potential of that individual is, there is to similar extent or to similar degree, the weakness, corresponding weakness. This is the part of this purpose of education 
to facilitate greater development of light to come through so that we can continue to work on you know transform the shadow part um, to in the light of the light itself this is often get missed out in understanding the purpose of education we get so yesterday also in several of the talks there was mention i believe uh, dr ankur had mentioned uh, had touched upon the need for the value dimension of education which dr parida really wonderfully brought it out in his summary um, of the various presentations again i think uh, the professor from um, tis dr sarangapani also mentioned about rethinking the purpose of education rethinking learning itself rethinking the role of family the role of parents so yes we are all for rethinking the role of different agencies involved in the education but if not now when would we be ready to start talking about the whole purpose education we typically is under the mental the cognitive the intellectual the rational development of the being what about the development of the character these i am not here talking or proposing you know um, sort of a mental understanding of value education because the moral education as we typically understand because that only goes so far as we have seen you know it's like a band aid uh, sort of like a add on thing that we add to rest of the existing mega curriculum that we expect students to believe that doesn't work that has not worked ever and especially since independence we hope continued with this whole mccollywin uh, view of education which only focuses on developing the mental aspect the mental capability of the students but even there it's only the rational part of the mental being that looks at that gets uh, some attention what about the faculty of concentration how to concentrate mentally intellectually on a given topic so this is especially important in present times where you know always complaining about lack of concentration lack of attention span in students especially now with all these social media you know 140 280 character kind of uh, uh, attention that people have not willing to read anything deeper not willing to contemplate on any deeper aspect so since we live in pondicherry i think it becomes really important to um, look at some of the educational insights and educational psychological insights that we have from uh, sri aurobindo and the mother people who lived right here the visionaries the rishis who lived right here and who have given us this grand futuristic vision of education um and to draw some key insights from there in terms of how in the post covid world we can begin to have conversations on the deeper dimension the inner dimension of education that is so often ignored now one of the things sri aurobindo and the mother often talked about was the significance of vital education what is the vital part in each one of us the vital part is the life energy the life play the emotional nature in us we often think that education is all about you know um developing the mind it is to some extent to a very large extent but more and more people now are talking about the intelligence of the emotion itself the emotional being the intelligence of the emotional being itself emotional how education what should be the role of education in developing that emotional education and i think interestingly the complex situation that we are in the this whole pandemic itself has given us some insights into that um so there is all this talk about this virus being yes and hence all the masks all the hygiene good those are all very important physical measures i'm just going to share this as an example here but have we thought about that could there be another inner dimension to what this virus is or what is this thing called contagion is it some physical entity we can't even see it if you from the point of view of deeper psychology 
Um, and um, this again takes us back to the visionaries right from Pondicherry, Sri Aurobindo and the mother. They tell us that every vibration is contagious to some extent. Uh, every vibration, even this, what we call as germs and viruses or microbes, they are at some level in the subtle physical realm of existence. We are so focused on the material reality, we forget that there are planes of existence beyond this and behind this material that in a certain physical realm of existence, it's some kind of subtle vibration of ill will that often gets translated into a physical illness. We have, all of us have some kind of a subtle physical, vital physical, vital, the emotional and physical, the, since the integration of the two, some kind of a nervous sheath around us that is our first armor, first line of defense against any bad will, against any ill will, including any external illness as well, external migraine. So what can be the role of education in helping learners and teachers both develop a strong sense of nervous sheath around us, a strong impenetrable nervous being around us so that we can protect ourselves, protect ourselves from any kind of ill will, any kind of malice coming towards us. The best security is to develop those qualities within because the more goodwill we have for others, the more generosity we have for others, it's our first line of defense against any um, attack of ill will, malice coming from the rest of the world. This entire is nothing but a play of vibrations. It's these kinds of truths that have been so left out from all our discourse on education. Um, the role of some kind of an emotional equilibrium, how to handle disappointments, how to handle failures in life, how to grow into higher qualities. Um, all these are often ignored in our curriculum. So this kind of vital education um, has been so badly neglected in our understanding of what true education should be. And my proposal is, or my um, suggestion is, that if not now, when? We start thinking about these, this dimension of education. Um, how to develop a certain kind of inner trust in our own willpower, a confidence in the mystery of life that exists around us, some kind of a trust in a higher force, whatever we want to call it, um, developing a sense of quietude, inner peace, inner calmness, um, becoming aware of the interactions of various parts of our being, how our emotions interact with our physical nature, how our intellect, uh, rational being, is the emotional part of us. All this um, deeper self-awareness has to be incorporated into the purpose of education itself. So, in fact, uh, you know, I, um, I'm going to send this to Dr. Aruna. I had put together a little presentation. I'm not going to share it uh, given the paucity of time, but I had uh, listed like seven or eight points in terms of how education, both teachers and learners can uh, work together on building some sort of a personal, you know, we hear the term PPE, personal protective equipment. So I changed it to call it building our own positive preventive equipment. The, uh, how we can work on building a more deeper understanding of who I am, I interact with the vibrations existing in the outer world. This is where the significance of what influences we allow to come in, in our own mental, emotional being comes in. This has implication on what is to be selected for curriculum. One of the things that um, we often, um, one of the reasons why I started with the story was also to highlight this part 
And we often ignore the value of stories in our classroom. There has been so much talk about how to rethink curriculum, how to rethink pedagogy. Why not, especially at this time, where some of our conventional ideas of classroom learning are being challenged to an nth degree. Role of stories. Um, Dr. Disha mentioned about joy in learning. I am all for creating joy in learning, whether it happens in classroom space, real space, in virtual space, or in neighborhood like what Dr. Shrikala was talking about. There are all these pedagogies happening, great thoughts coming out, great ideas being shared. But the real question is what happens in those alternative learning spaces that we create, whether it is home, family, classrooms. So stories are there not to draw only moral lessons from it, but to engage the learner at various levels, emotional, creative, imaginative, intellectual, rational, if there are two or three people involved together, you know, let's say in the neighborhood setting that Dr. Shrikala was mentioning, engaging them, engaging those small group of children in creating their own stories, writing their own stories, uh, that could be a great way to learning. All the uh, films that are out there using films as a way to engage children's imagination. That could be another way to build emotional intelligence in the students. Um, arts education, that is one key thing that India has, Indian education system has ignored. And I was happy to see that in the new education policy, there was um, quite a bit of reference to mainstreaming or better integration of arts education with the rest of the education. Arts should not be left to just one or two periods in the class. All children, regardless of their talent or skill in whatever our kind of arts, should be given opportunity to, to develop a certain aesthetic sense, a sense of beauty, a sense of harmony. Because again, that that often gets ignored in its terms of its role, key role that it plays in refining our character, in refining our emotions. Anybody who has a deeper sense of beauty, harmony, joy, good, you know, what we today in modern language call as, you know, carrying good vibes, will be very rarely drawn to crudity and vulgarity in nature, in their own behavior, in their own character. Why can't arts education be rethought as an important aspect of education in especially in the post covid scenario post covid scenario and certainly during the pandemic itself because that is one thing that i believe can be very creatively worked upon in the challenging learning teaching situations that we have use of project methods not necessarily you know shri kalaji was talking about uh, do we really have to worry about salvaging the year, finishing a curriculum? We need to start thinking about creating different pedagogies, creating different ways of learning, different ways of engaging learners' imagination, creativity, intellectual abilities in creating some kind of a project-based learning where you don't have to have a regular two-hour or three-hour of virtual classroom and you know all the questions of access and some of those you know internet internet availability and those things could be somewhat addressed where you have given them a project to work on and let them come back within a week and see what is the progress so there can be so many ways to start rethinking education and one last thing before i conclude none of this would be really if we ignore one very important dimension the the significance of the inner work that the teacher herself or himself will be doing upon themselves a teacher not only teaches through instruction but a teacher has a deeper influence um, on the learners through example 
and through the by through the influence that she has the subtle influence he or he has for the learners whether it is in the real context of a real physical classroom or even in a virtual space so the the deeper a teacher goes in her own understanding of who she is what are the what is the kind of emotional intelligence she carries the more work she does on developing her own awareness her own emotional intelligence the better influence that she can be on the learner herself on the learners themselves this dimension again is somewhat ignored when we talk of teacher education so what i propose here is that to not to get so i mean the sociological various sociological dimensions that have been discussed are all very valuable access equity um the kind of challenges that we face but once we have addressed these challenges which is again not a simple task i understand what happens in the classrooms during the pandemic even before the pandemic or especially after especially after the pandemic if what we have learned through this unprecedented experience if we don't apply it in rethinking education moving forward we are just going to create another bandaid type of situation a solution which may not really solve uh, the problems that we have even in our society in our nation that our education has not it fails to prepare individuals to live with the truth of life to live in harmony with life how we we expect social societal harmony to come together yes that's a noble goal but what about harmony in within ourselves harmony with existence itself harmony with the life itself unless an individual is harmonized within there can be no outer harmony that can be sustained that can only that can be um, we, that we can say as has some kind of a sustainable that we have arrived at so i conclude with just this one thought that while we are talking of all the outer problems the outer challenges that we have in education what this pandemic has brought for us is truly a wake up call to look at the inner psychological dimensions of learning itself in the uh, psychological dimensions of education and the role of education in preparing the individual to live a harmonious life inwardly so that that harmony gets expressed outwardly so with that i conclude my brief remark and i thank you once again dr aruna and um, everyone else in your organizing team for giving me an opportunity to share share few insights and i will be um, i will email you the brief presentation that i have you can share it with all the participants as you see it thank you thank you thank you uh, dr uh, mehra for that very insightful presentation and uh, staying true to uh, a resident of pondicherry as well your uh, uh, take was uh, very interesting and very in, uh, um, a very uh, uh, you know um, uh, noble way of looking and you know we can look at our inner self first also right so uh, to move on i want to invite uh, miss surbi Nak nakbal and uh, mr ankit saraf are you here yes yes yes, yes. okay so uh, um they are third uh, class from tis and iima their uh, topic is uh, covid 19 and non teaching workload of teachers so uh, i want to uh, give you the time now please uh, i hand over the time to you thank you so much and good afternoon everybody and thank you uh, to the organizing committee to uh, giving us an opportunity to present our work and reflections so uh, we are trying to uh, present the covid uh, 19 and non teaching workload of teachers uh we have uh, done a short uh, study where we have analyzed the articles and based on these newspaper articles we try and identify different themes and uh, uh, reflections that we have uh, come about uh, based on our analysis 
Uh, so uh, first, I would like to uh, begin with the quote uh, that was published in the newspaper, uh, which was uh, said by a government school teacher in Punjab. Uh, Since the lockdown, they have put us on duty at airports, at railway stations, to take note of people from outside and keep track of them. We have been on duties during wheat procurement. I am the supervisory officer for COVID containment in a cluster of 12 villages. We also continue to work as block level officers for elections in revising the voting list. And all this while, we are doing online teaching. So this code gives a, 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 gives a peek into the kind of duties that the teachers are expected to do. And uh, this is the context of our uh, study. And we try to uh, understand the relationship between uh, these duties and teaching learning at large and the well-being of the teachers in this process. Uh, so uh, to just give you the glimpse of uh, what the study. Uh, uh, so we analyzed various newspaper articles. We analyzed uh, close to uh, 60 newspaper articles. And uh, these were uh, published. They were put in the public domain from 1st April to 30th September 2020. Uh, this was the time when, you know, uh, in in the months of april uh there were down teachers were put down to duties uh in uh, various capacities which i will uh, elaborate further uh the uh, the newspapers that we selected are english and hindi newspapers uh, and uh, the newspapers report uh, articles and uh, they report uh, issues from around the states and union territories in india so the issue is across uh, length and breadth of the country where teachers are being deputed on various uh, COVID-19 uh, duties. Uh, so uh, just to give you an overview, uh, the common uh, uh, ideas that came across after we went through these newspaper articles. So the common tasks that the teachers were uh, when were door-to-door uh, -door surveys, uh, these, these are common across uh, states. And, and very commonly, teachers are being assigned these duties. Uh, Containment zone surveys they are doing. Uh, they are also uh, are given uh, quarantine and isolation center coordination duties. Uh, COVID-19 prevention and awareness duties. Uh, many of them have been involved in ration distribution. And in some states, even accompanying hospital uh, medical teams for surveys or for checkups, etc. They have also been involved in contract uh, contact tracing and uh, even interstate border duties where they are you know uh, taking care of how what uh, vehicles are coming inside a particular state etc and when there was a huge migrant crisis which we all are aware of even migrant labor transportation duties teachers were involved in so these are the common uh, tasks that they were involved in across states there were also some less common duties for example uh, door to door ration uh, deliveries some in some states they were even and specifically, some districts, they were even asked to do door-to-door -door ration deliveries, uh, manning fair price shops, uh, taking care of the fair price shops, the ration shops. Uh, in fact, uh, checking liquor smuggling outside distilleries, restricting illegal sand mining, and crowd management at liquor and wine shops. So the last three, uh, uh, it, it, the order was passed, and it was revoked because teacher unions, teachers had the uh, 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 express their protest and uh, they, they did not like the kind of duties that the teachers were given. Now another, so uh, in all these newspaper articles across, there were teacher unions, teachers who were voicing their uh, opinions and they were saying that, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, we, we should not be given these duties. And the reasons that they were given, they were uh, giving were quite common. Uh, lack of PPE kits, uh, uh, they were saying that they're not being given uh, PPE kit. Hand sanitizers are not given. They were demanding COVID testing. They should be allowed uh, COVID testing because they are going out in these COVID times and performing these duties. Uh, adequate insurance cover. Some of the newspaper articles reported that uh, we need to increase e either providers' insurance cover or wherever they were provided, they wanted an increase in the amount of the insurance cover that was provided to them. Uh, also, uh, some of the newspaper articles uh, mentioned the lack of training that the teachers expressed because uh, some of these are very technical uh, duties, very uh, which require prior training. You are being stationed at quarantine centers, you are being stationed at uh, uh, hospitals. So, uh, due to paucity of time, 
uh, lack of training uh, is uh, also one uh, aspect that they uh, spoke about. Uh, also, uh, uh, in these uh, in in two states specifically, I'll uh, like to talk about Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. Even uh, teacher unions went ahead and they filed a public interest litigation uh, uh, in in uh, opposition to the kind of duties that they were given. And in Gujarat specifically, uh, it was reported that the teachers had withdrawn that. Uh, uh, court uh, said that they shouldn't be going against the uh, orders that the state is giving them. So this is these are the basic issues that were highlighted in these uh, newspaper articles. And uh, now we'll go a little deeper into why are we talking about these uh, non-teaching tasks that the teachers are providing, and that the teachers are being deputed on during this pandemic time. So let's first uh, talk about. Uh, the national education policy. Uh, uh, one uh, one more thing. Uh, uh, apart from uh, assigning these duties, uh, state also uh, the authority also went ahead and you know gave them show cause notices if they did not appear for the duty. Uh, gave them suspension uh, in some uh, in one of the districts in UP. Even the salaries were stopped and even uh, they were uh, physically harmed in uh, Kaimur uh, Bihar where. Uh, they accidentally slept on the duty when they were managing the uh, outflow of the migrant workers, and uh, uh, they were uh, kind of uh, physically assaulted uh, because of this behavior. And this was a night duty incident. So these kind of uh, issues have also been reported in the newspapers uh, in this particular time period. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying that uh, we want to talk about uh, why are we talking about these issues. So let's first get. Uh, uh, talk about what NEP 2020 says about teachers, their working conditions, and the role of the teachers. So, if I, I would like to directly quote certain uh, excerpts from the policy, the policy says that teacher must be at the center of fundamental reforms in the education system. It must help re-establish teachers at all levels as the most respected and essential members of our society must help recruit the very best and brightest to enter the teaching profession at all levels by ensuring respect, dignity, and autonomy. So here they do talk about uh, uh, best people entering the teaching profession and you know improving the dignity and autonomy related with the profession. It recognizes an important role of the teachers. And it says that teachers are the heart of the learning process. And it places responsibility of realizing the policy goals on them. So they are the mediator of the policy. And thus, there's a need for a positive working environment and a positive working condition. So this is what NEP says. Another aspect that NEP uh, puts forward is teachers truly shape the future of our children and therefore the future of our nation. And hence, the need for overhauling the service environment and culture of schools to maximize the ability of teachers to do their jobs effectively and to ensure that they are part of vibrant, caring, and inclusive communities of teacher. So the, this is the vision that they have for the teacher and the culture of the school. Uh, with respect to engagement of teachers specifically in non-teaching activity, the policy states that to prevent large amount of time spent currently by teachers in non-teaching activities, teachers will not be engaged in any, any longer in a work that is not directly related to uh, teaching so that they may fully concentrate on their teaching learning duties. So uh, it, it, it says that they'll not be involved in strenuous administrative tasks, and even the time they spend on midday meal will be rationalized. So all these kind of things NEP mentions. That is why we uh, bring this uh, topic uh, today uh, to discuss with all of you, because what the NEP says and uh, what is happening, how the teachers are being put on these duties. Uh, is, is, is in stark contrast. So NEP falls short on, according to our uh, analysis, falls short on various uh, aspects. It does not clearly outline the professional terms of employment for school teachers. right? And uh, uh, it, it has used uh, phrases like positive working environment, positive service conditions, but they have not been appropriately explained. So it, it's now up to the states or uh, to understand what these positive working environment and service conditions uh, mean. Uh, and also, uh, there's a difference in what draft NEP 2019 said about non-teaching duties and uh, 
what NEP 2020, which has now come, uh, which, which we all have read, uh, uh, says. The draft NEP says that the teachers will not be assigned any non-teaching duty or administrative assignment, except those which are ordered by the Supreme Court, so as to allow teachers to concentrate on their teaching learning activities. But NEP 2020 does not say this. It does not make any definitive statements that only uh, Supreme Court ordered duties will be given to teachers. Uh, NEP does speak about setting up a national professional standards for teacher, periodic performance appraisals, incentivizing teachers, linking salary and promotions to performance, and selecting the best and brightest who are committed to nation building to uh, make teachers more accountable and efficient because we know there's an entire discourse on learning outcomes and accountability of teachers which is very uh, which is very common but it maintains silence and doesn't define properly what are the working conditions of the teachers so these are some uh, uh, you know uh, things that were missing in nep 2020 and this is the context of this uh, presentation because uh, when we want to bring in bright uh, talents or you know people who want to come into teaching then the working conditions and the service conditions must must be taken care of and the way uh, in the coercive way the teachers are being assigned these duties uh, is, is complete contrast uh, we would also uh, like to make a connect to uh, how teachers are being uh, uh, hailed as corona warriors they have the newspaper articles which uh, uh, call uh, teachers corona warriors and even the uh, high court of delhi said that the teachers are the frontline workers and you know they are hailed as corona warriors but what effect does it have on the teaching learning process and uh, here we would want to uh, say that you know teachers rightly pointed out by nep they mediate the role of policy makers they mediate the role of administrators and they are a very very important aspect a uh, very important stakeholder of the teaching learning process so teachers actions are dependent on their motivation capacities overall well-being and the conditions under which they work now in in, in such conditions where they feel anxious where they uh, where they don't feel adequately trained and where they feel uh, you know that we are not able to properly uh, prepare for our classrooms we are not able to uh, go back and uh, see how do we reach out to each student in this uh, pandemic it it really is uh, uh, dependent on their motivation and various studies have uh, been done to indicate that these uh, motivation uh, uh, is is directly related to the actions of teachers their internal states are influenced by their working condition their perception of uh, uh, the profession uh, it, it is is really influenced by their working conditions that they are in uh, RT assigns three types of non-teaching duties. Uh, right to education assigns three types of non-teaching duties: uh, census, disaster relief, elections. And although elections might sound as you know just one election duty, but there are so many levels of elections going on in our country, and they are being uh, uh, pulled in for these uh, duties, and they are uh, uh, pulled in for training for these duties to explain how to undertake the entire process. So it, 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 we are talking about a huge uh, workload that teachers face during this time. Uh, also, we all know this regularly assigned extra duties to teacher polio immunization, HH uh, household surveys, or uh, um, in some places even monitoring school based civil and construction work. So, apart from this, there are there is administrative work related to students within the schools, uh, like uh, they are maintaining numerous registers uh, at at a time, and uh, uh, they they are preparing Aadhaar cards for the students. Some bank transfers, uh, which has have to happen for the students, are also being taken care of by the teachers. So these are the kind of duties that you know they are uh, uh, commissioned for. And even uh, there was a study uh, recently, uh, not not recently, but uh, uh, two around two years back. Uh, this study was commissioned by the government, and the study uh, finds out that you know teachers spend eighty one percent of their time on non teaching tasks. And out of the 220 teaching days, they uh, spend about 42 uh, days only teaching. This, this, this is what the study reported. But uh, however, the study, although commissioned by the government, surprisingly not made public. And we got to know about this study when we were finding out uh, newspaper articles. And uh, the researchers had given an interview or shared their findings with the newspaper. So this is one study. Uh, 
uh, which has been reported. Another study was converted by uh, CPR Accountability Initiative about, uh, f uh, with Delhi government school teachers. And you know, uh, that study reports that you know, apart from these administrative tasks that come from the state uh, uh, on disaster relief or elections or census, there are administrative duties in the school. And this affects their teaching. This affects the time that they spend with students. And uh, this really affects the entire teaching Across. Although assignment of these duties is not new, it, it, it has been happening. But why do we need to talk about it during this uh, period of pandemic? Because uh, we UNESCO, UNICEF, all the reports have uh, pointed out that this is the time when we need to uh, take care that students don't drop out of the system. So teachers with increased administrative duties are less likely to instructional planning teaching and evaluating students work and submissions and more time on these administrative duties and thereby it affects the learning uh, arms and on one hand there is a huge focus on these learning outcome accountability of the teachers and on the other hand uh, teachers have such less time to even prepare for teaching in these uh, circumstances this COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation uh, teachers feel guilty disappointed and other negative emotions uh, this uh, study that I've been uh, talking about, the uh, one done by Accountability Initiative, they, uh, it, it, uh, in the interviews, teachers expressed that, you know, they had emotions or they were not happy or they felt guilty about not doing what they were primarily recruited for, that is the teaching learning activities. Uh, uh, so this is what uh, uh, really uh, kind of uh, brings out uh, the conditions of the uh, teachers and also its effect on the teaching learning processes. Uh, it also affects the self image, morale and relationship with the students, right? The perception of the profession. Uh, at, at, on one hand, NEP says that we have to kind of uh, uh, improve the working conditions, but these kind of uh, duties and then the coercive uh, methods used by the state, sending show cause notices, suspensions, not giving salary, it kind of has an effect on self morale and relationship with the students. Also. Then you get a little time for self-reflection and professional development because now we've been relying on technology. There are uh, teachers have to acquaint themselves, prepare themselves at this crucial how to reach out to each student through these technological uh, tools that we have. And teachers do not have time to do that, uh, uh, to that kind of self-reflection and professional development. Uh, it, it also, so, as I mentioned before, it also affects the attractiveness of teaching profession. Uh, if, if you want the brightest people, you want people who, uh, as, as uh, Disha Ma'am also pointed out, the policies talking about passionate individuals, want people to come in, then we have to increase the attractiveness of teaching profession. And uh, the way uh, the state, the authorities think about the teachers uh, by assigning duties and how it, it, it really affects the attractiveness of the teaching profession and I think I've mentioned this before if you are focusing on the learning outcome discourse accountability discourse but where is the time uh, for the teachers who are teaching in government schools to if, you know balance out these things and then they're held accountable for the results that uh, come out so it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stark contrast to what is being said and uh, apart from this process uh, it's, its effect on the teaching learning processes there's a discontent among teachers uh, they feel overburdened, their self-efficacy. Our informal conversations have also indicated, you know, highly mismanaged the way the duties are assigned. Uh, all those things, those feelings also teachers have uh, voiced and they have even voiced it in the newspaper articles that we've looked at. So there's a role conflict. So the responsibility of the teacher who mediates the role of the policy, the state, the parents, etc., as a, being a learning facilitator. but they, they are also civil servants, they are also community mobilizers, uh, they are also administrators because they are performing all these duties. So there's a role conflict and this has been highlighted by the study done with the Delhi government school teachers, uh, how these duties create a conflict and what roles are they appointed for. So, uh, so what, are we, uh, what are we pointing at? We are pointing that there's urgent need to define these non-teaching roles. Uh, even the NAB, it, it doesn't define what are these non-teaching roles and specify the tasks of these roles because otherwise it's left to open interpretation and different states and authorities, you know, uh, they kind of interpret in different ways and different kind of tasks are being uh, assigned to the 
teachers uh, in summary uh, uh, we would uh, like to make a few points that you know pulling out teachers out of their instructional responsibilities during this uh, time where there are school closures there's a danger of people dropping out uh, even even gender inequality within uh, education system more uh, there have been studies which are saying that girls will be affected more it's going to just uh, strengthen the you know deepen the existing educational inequities teachers will not have the time to reflect on to think about how to reach out to each students and how to uh, ensure that the learning process happens even in this pandemic time uh, rec the unesco and unicef uh, in various reports in various articles that they have been uh, putting out during this covid-19 pandemic they are saying that you know uh, teachers must be uh, the ones who uh, you know are to handle these inequalities that are going to happen because of this pandemic but here teachers are uh, struggling out to carry even uh, regular classes and uh, uh, th this is a huge uh, area of concern and uh, and really these are teachers who work in the government and uh, we all know in many of the government schools there are first generation learners who need more support uh, who need uh, uh, the teacher has to think more about how to uh, you know provide equal access to everyone and these are the students from vulnerable and marginalized sections so it, it's it's really going to deepen the educational inequalities that are already existing uh, and the the way in which these deputations happen, the coercive ways, the show cause notices, etc., it, it really affects the image and teacher, uh, image of the teacher and the profession which NEP wants to kind of improve. Uh, uh, this, so in order to increase this, uh, when we talk about motivation of teacher, we want the teachers to be passionate, but you know, improving their professionalism, improving, enhancing the working condition, the service conditions. If you you feel if, if, if the teacher well-being in an environment, then it's directly going to impact your teaching learning processes. So there's an urgent need to do that. Uh, yeah, and uh, so present context uh, because of these duties, and we've been reading these articles. It uh, it's less hope that the status of the teacher and teaching profession will improve significantly despite NEP uh, trying to present a vision uh, of, of teachers who are the important stakeholders in the teaching learning process and thereby improving their uh, uh, professionalism and thereby improving their working conditions. So uh, at this point, I would also like to uh, quickly invite uh, my co-researcher if he wants to add anything or to say something about the work, yeah. Uh, nothing much to add. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, yeah, I have some problem with the audio uh, in my uh, computer. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Surbi and uh, Mr. Ankit for that uh, very uh, uh, lovely presentation. It was a very, I think, extensive uh, research that you have done, starting from the beginning of the pandemic. I think from uh, in India to you know to to till the thirtieth of uh, September. I think it's uh, you know a very uh, uh, elaborate work that you have done. Um, thank. Uh, uh, I want to thank all the visitors. And uh, uh, now I open, I mean, if there is, I don't see any questions that have come up in the chat box, but if uh, there is anyone who wish to uh, ask a, to any of the presenters, I would like to welcome the questions. No. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Looks like. Yes. yes. Um, 
uh, and I'm really thankful to all the presenters. Uh, they all have done uh, given a very um, uh, you know uh, very varied uh, you know outlook towards the issue, and um, we could uh, get information both from the you know how to address these uh, you know from an um, into perspective, also from the uh, you know how to understand the children and also how to have an introspection etc. That's fine. But I also you know would like to pose uh, uh, you know one question to uh, Dr. Belu. Belu, uh, you have uh, you know rightly talked about the uh, uh, you know introspection that is required and um, you know how to really uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, you know, uh, you know change the way we address the issues. In that context, I would like to know: Would you like to give some practical suggestions to the school or the, you know, the, the institution to how to go about with a few things, um, so that uh, you know it might be useful? Right. And uh, you have your, uh, you know, vital input, and we will be happy to listen. To <clears throat> sure. I think um, the very first thing, like I said would be, um, and this takes us back to, you know, the new education policy, the fact that we are calling it new. And if we continue to look at education from an perspective, you know, from an from our existing um, definition of education, we are not really walking the path of the new. So I, first of all, like, you know, this could be a very long discussion. So I wanted to be very specific and precise. I'll just take one quick example. If education has to be of the whole person, it has to address all parts of our being. We are not just not just rationality and reason and intellect. We are also heart. We are also physical. And then the way these three parts interact with one another, your emotional state has an impact on how concentrate, how much concentration I can bring to a task in hand. So unless we address the emotional state of the learner and the teacher, uh, we cannot fully work on developing or building learners' ability to concentrate on a task at hand. So this is just one simple example. So let's take the example of emotion of fear. That's a very valid, relevant emotion given the pandemic situation today. You know, there is so much. I remember were to do a really good study of how this pandemic spread so quickly, so fast. The role of media, social media, and the gossip that happens on all the, you know, WhatsApp and social media, that probably played, if not, you know, 70%, maybe 50 to 60% of the role in spread of the virus itself. These are the kinds of deeper truths, psycholo deep psychological truths that often get ignored in understanding. So the way fear spreads, um, you know, the contagion power that fear has, how can, what can be the role of education in helping a learner and a teacher work on this emotion of fear? Because once that is taken care of, once that is replaced with emotion of courage, fearlessness, um, calm courage, not violent, passionate kind of strength that I'm talking of. Some kind of a calm quietitude in one's ability to face situations in life uh, that comes with developing a strong, a strong faith in one's own self, no matter what the situation. All these have to be incorporated in the learning process itself. This is where I think the, that's the practical insight to really take a hard look at our curriculum that every lesson can we incorporate some of these qualities in the way information is uh, you know, shared with the students. Can we come up with learning activities that allow students to maybe write stories, create situations, learn from their own life situations? How, you know, what was one situation where they handled a disappointment with the feeling of fail, fearlessness, courage, those kinds of things. So learn from our own life, learn from um, stories that play around us from past, present to all kinds of, you know, I mean, when you watch a film, take one example of a scenario from a, a narrative from a film and talk about how 
uh, you know, when was the character displaying fearlessness? When was the character uh, becoming victim of one's own fears, one's own sense of limitation? So there can be so many interesting ways it can be addressed in any learning situation. But I understand, as Surabhi ji was uh, rightly pointed out, where is the time? So where is the time for teachers to engage with the learning material in such in-depth if they are so short of all these, uh, you know, if they are so caught up with all the other responsibilities? And I say this because I have seen my sister, who is a teacher in Delhi government system, and uh, the kind of um, situation that she has had to deal with in the, you know, uh, pandemic situation, having no PPE kits, and the, even the loss of life daily teachers experience. Um, for several months, in some parts of daily teachers were not paid. So all these issues are very real. All these, naturally, you are actually making teachers more fearful of the situation. So that's, you know, how can they work on their curriculum if they are living with that condition? So both the outer dimension and the inner dimension has to be addressed. This is what I think is the need of the hour. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure some of the students uh, in, uh, wanted to ask a few questions. If you're ready, please proceed. Uh, I mean, I'm sure I saw one or two coming up. Can I add to the discussion, Dr. Adana? Yes, please, ma'am. Please. Yes. I yeah. think uh, Dr. Uh, Imti, yes. please take over. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. So basically, I'd like to just uh, clarify my position on passion. I should, I should be misunderstood. Passion and self-protection, all of that is important for anybody, right? For everybody, in fact. The only problem is when you use passion and self-protection against the teachers. So the structural constraints in the environment, you have huge numbers of students in your class, or you don't even have a washroom to go to, or you have pathetic teaching learning resources, or there's supervision, there's surveillance camera, there's micromanaging, micromonitoring happening. Then it's used against the teachers. So you say that the structural constraints are there in the environment. If you have passion, it's OK to live with them. And that, to me, is a problem. When you use the idea of passion and self relation so teachers are there for meditation, Vipassana and stuff like that. So you're not correcting the imbalance in the system of the teacher outside of her. You're constantly constraining her in several ways, but you expect the teacher to overcome all that and not be bothered about all that. So that's the position which I take. So passion is something which is good, and everyone should be passionate about whatever they're doing in life, right? But if you're using the word passion, if you're using the word passion against the teacher and say that if you have passion, you forget about your salary, you forget about your working conditions, you forget about bad teaching learning resources, you forget about poor infrastructure, you forget about whatever is required for you to be a teacher, a good teacher. So that's where I'm coming from, and I didn't want to be misunderstood. Mm. Thank you. Yes, is there any other question? From students? Okay. So, uh, uh, I would like to uh, move on to the uh, board of thanks, but uh, before that, I want I, I was also reminded of uh, this uh, cartoon that had come, you know, where there there is a tree and all kinds of animals, and you are, you know, that all the animals are able to climb the tree, you know, however yeah. way you wish to climb yeah. it. So I think, uh, especially the first two uh, <clears throat> first two uh, presentations had, you know, I think uh, ideas of that as well, and how these layered hierarchies need to be first taken care of, you know, look into all the other, all the rest. Like, you know, yes, we, yes, it's good to talk about emotional intelligence, but, you know, first let's take care of the basics and also, and only then, you know. So I think, yes, that is what, but uh, all the four presentations, actually five presenters, uh, uh, you know, had, uh, presented such uh, uh, good uh, uh, presentations and such good presentations, very meaningful, very, uh, very, uh, you know, very, uh, 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 very apt 
for uh, this situation and uh, how we can uh, look at and you know uh, when we are uh, teaching uh, university level uh, students even then we have so many problems so i can only imagine or i can even even want to go there you know yeah. to imagine <laughs> the kind yeah. of problems school teachers would have uh, in uh, such situations Yes. So uh, thank you so much. I want to uh, again formally extend uh, our uh, 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 thanks to Professor Nawani, uh, Dr. Shrikala, uh, uh, Dr. Mehra, uh, Ms. Surbi, and uh, Mr. Ankit for such a wonderful presentation and also for keeping time, actually. I have to, you know, uh, uh, intervene anywhere, and, you know, for any one of you to remind uh, of you of time. So keeping time. So uh, uh, thank you so much for that. So uh, I want to hand over the uh, other session to uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Aruna. And also, I want to thank Aruna, Madam, for you know bringing all of you here. You know, just like uh, uh, it's also a blessing in disguise that you know we otherwise we would not have had this kind of eminent panel with us. You know, to travel and all of that. So, thank you so much, uh, Madam, for uh, making this possible. And so, I hand over the next session to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. for. Uh, handling the ceremony. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank all the speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not possible. Our, professor, our head of the department, uh, Pravunti, is also here. I am sure he would like to say a few words. Uh, sir, uh, okay, I think he is um, not connected Mute. now. Okay. Sir, yes. connected, but you have to unmute, unmute sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I missed uh, the presentations. None of the presentations actually I had the opportunity to hear in full. So I missed. I was really excited to listen up to all of them. But unfortunately, due to some other assignment, I missed. And I hope I will get this sense from my colleagues. And uh, we have actually probably the recorded kind of present. All these yes, things are recorded. We have, it. have a chance to go through them. And I am thankful to all of you that you joined this program and met uh, this uh, very kind of grand success. Now the time may be there to move on to the next session. So we don't have time to interact. Thank you so much personally. Uh, I do not know many of you, but I think I we know professionally, uh, Professor uh, Disan Awani, I heard we have not met. Uh, so I, I was actually looking forward to listen to her, but unfortunately I missed. Uh, hopefully we'll meet again and we'll interact somewhere else. Thank you everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so thank once again all the um, experts who had taken their time here. Uh, and it was a very, very useful uh, lecture. And uh, I'm sure many of the students have been uh, very keenly listening to all of that and they would uh, take it up for their future research and they also the very young scholars who had really given a very uh, detailed presentation and i thank uh, madam uh, 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 Devani for uh, kind of uh, introducing them to us and uh, we are very i mean we are very impressed with their presentation thank you um, shurbi and um, ankit so we uh, look forward for more presentations from you and so now with this, we end the um, technical session and we will move on to the uh, valedictory session. So that would begin soon. Um, and I request all of you to stay back if time permits to join us for the valedictory. Uh, in fact, we had a very fruitful uh, sessions in the last two days. Um, and I thank each and everyone on behalf of the Social Department of Sociology and as well as on my own personal staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so soon after this, we uh, I request all the participants to please uh, Fill up the feedback form and uh, we will send you the um, uh, certificates soon. Um, we will uh, start the virtual session in another few minutes. Uh, just waiting for the uh, director to join and then we will start. Uh, give me another two, three minutes and I will check up and then I will, uh, yeah. you know, we will start with that. Right. Sir, is it okay? Yeah. Sir, Indeed. yes, sir. I had called Dean. Uh, he said he has no connectivity there from the silver clickers. So it okay, looks like okay. Uh, okay. he may not be able to join. Um, but he said okay. if, if there is connectivity, he would join. Otherwise, he okay. asks us to excuse him. 
So, so, so another, sir, another few minutes. Once uh, the oh, director oh, joins, we will immediately yes, start. Yes, sir, I will yes, call sir. up the uh, director's yes. office. Thanks. Yes. Meanwhile, I request all of you to stay back because um, uh, I request all the participants to stay tuned because we have very important uh, validatory address by Navanita Madam. Uh, she is a very, uh, very well-known sociologist and a very impressive. Um, I'm sure all of you would be happy to listen to her. So I request you all to stay back. I know it's lunchtime, but uh, we will have enough time, enough uh, food for thought. So please stay back. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Okay. I don't know, whatever I'm getting, I'm just forwarding to you. <laughs> okay.
Uh, sir, uh, sir, on. Hi, yes, sir. yes. So, Director Saras, go join. Sir. Director Saras, uh, join. Yes, sir. No, sir. Actually, he has gone to VC's office, it seems, sir. But uh, looks like we can start the program, sir, so then he can join. Did, did, did he say like that? Or we have no, uh, no, sir. No, sir. Uh, he said he would join in 10 minutes, but then uh, it was unexpectedly he had gone to the vice chancellor's cabin. So he couldn't confirm anything to anybody, sir. Okay. So, so but we can't, we need not wait, I believe, sir. So we can start and then once he comes, I will call him up and inform him, sir. No problem. So we can start the program, sir. So once he joins, he can uh, share with us a few moments, a few times. Few minutes, sir. Yeah, is that okay, yeah, sir? it is okay because if we delay yes, it, then it will be. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Many await. Yes, sir. So we will yeah. start the program, sir. I'm sure he will um, agree with this uh, plan. So, sir, yeah, shall yes, we? Yes, no, sir. Yeah, please we'll okay. start. Uh, I will call him and inform him, sir. No problem. Okay. Sure. So, Navanita Madam, are joining so, or not? No, yes, sir, she's there. She's there. She's there. She's there. Okay, okay. okay. I'm Fine. there. Okay. 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 So I think then we are. She's the key person today, so we can start. But then once uh, director joins, we can have his uh, address. Sir. All right. So with your consent, shall I proceed, sir? Yes, please, please. Okay. Proceed. Right. Uh, thank you all for staying back. I know uh, this is a lunchtime, but despite that, you had stayed back, uh, you know, understanding the importance of the program. And also, I'm sure many of you wanted to listen to a key lecture. So thank you for all of that. And we would now move on to the, the valedictorian. I welcome one and all formally to this valedictory session once again. And for this, uh, this valedictory yes. section is part of the two-day webinar on responding to COVID-19, school education and its stakeholders which is sponsored by Azim Premji University Research Grants. We had a very productive webinar. And all the lectures were very interesting and very informative. Um, and all this was possible with the team effort of the Department of Sociology, and headed by Professor Mohanty, B.B. Mohanty. Uh, sir had been the key pillar behind organization of this event, also giving a very comfortable and supportive environment. So I'm sure we are very happy at this end of this two-day webinar and request Professor Mahanti to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Dr. Aruna, for your kind words. Very good afternoon to all of you. Respected uh, Director, Culture and Cultural Relations of our University, Professor Rajiv Jain, who is likely to join soon. And uh, the Dean also, is, he may join, Professor Murthy. And the validated speaker, Professor Navanita Rath. And Dr. Aruna, the key organizer of this event. And the esteemed resource persons and delegates from different parts and colleagues, my dear colleagues from our department. I see Dr. Poridas, Dr. Porida, Professor Dastagir, and Dr. Mansi, and colleagues from other departments, research scholars, students, and friends. Now we have come to the last part or end of this last two days deliberations on the webinar responding to COVID-19 school education and its stakeholders. We had a very fruitful and meaningful deliberations for the last two days, two days and having a kind of good set of speakers who touched upon various aspects and various dimensions of this COVID crisis, its impact on school education and a consequence response from the stakeholders. I have nothing special to add or special to offer. And I will just say few lines as a kind of appendix. Uh, you know, uh, all know that this is a kind of unprecedented pandemic 
which has impacted very uh, severely the different sectors of economy and society and more specifically having a kind of prolonged effect on our educational sector and school system. And the different stakeholders of the school education, like parents, students, teachers, state, the management of schools, and the civil society at large, they have responded to this crisis in varied ways because these stakeholders are differently located and differently positioned and based on the context and location and the level of their development and level of their kind of uh, necessity, their requirement and their uh, coping strategy, they have responded. And all these stakeholders, they are also, if you see each group, it's not a kind of a homogeneous. There is a kind of tremendous differences among each group. For example, parents, there are resource full parents, resource poor parents, resource poor parents, students also. Likewise, there are slow learners, there are actually disadvantaged uh, section students, and those who are also students from the affluent section having kind of good mental ability. And teachers are also, likewise, some of them are not so equipped to handle this online uh, teaching technologies. And likewise, the school management, therefore, the response is quite varied, and it varies not only from country to country, but also from within, from within, within the country and within a particular kind of region. And therefore, I would say that it's a kind of response is quite varied and complex and difficult to be captured within two days deliberations. Nonetheless, these two days deliberations, they have addressed many issues and also raised some of these key questions which needs more elaboration and more kind of concrete answer. And for that, we may need some more webinars of this variety to extend the discussion further and to carry the points which were actually raised forward. One thing I can say that the, uh, the now we have seen a lot of discussions and we have also seen the newspaper writings, the journal articles, and also many kind of uh, studies, independent studies, commission studies, quick assessment reports, they're all coming in. And if you see, uh, very carefully, we can see that uh, the, uh, the response of these stakeholders can be viewed from three perspectives. One is that one perspective highlights the transformative aspect, the transformation that how the transformation is taking place in teaching learning practices, how we are shifting to online technologies where laptop, smartphones, internet facilities, they have become kind of uh, and uh, inherent kind of uh, uh, yeah, indispensable kind of uh, requirement for teaching. And also uh, the kind of transformation has taken place completely in the educational sector, which was not hard. The entire kind of relationship between among the teachers, students, parents, school, all these things have undergone kind of transformation. And from this perspective, the, the particularly the uh, development experts or the social scientists also, some of them also saying that how the transformation is taking place and not only in the educational sector or in the technology, but all our social science discourse, the whole, cons the entire range of concepts and kind of theoretical understanding of teaching learning practices and the school of education, sorry, the, the sociology of education, it initially, uh, it need to reconceptualize and re-theorize. So the entire kind of, all these aspects have kind of experienced a kind of transformation. That is what the view, one group of scholars, policy experts, and uh, the development kind of experts, they, uh, they advocate. And the other kind of uh, perspective is that it's a kind of, uh, uh, they, they view from human rights and social exclusion perspective, which we have discussed uh, 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 yesterday and today also some of them also touched upon this point. point. 
uh, that uh, how this social exclusion and uh, uh, this uh, human rights was, you know, some of them argue that uh, this kind of transformation, this kind of shifting to online technology, it has led to a kind of uh, the violation of human rights in the sense that the right to education is being questioned. The everybody's right, the right to education and that to quality education is being questioned and certain section of society and it's, their number is quite large and large section of the students and parents, they are being excluded because they do not have access to these technologies and they do not have a kind of a, a necessary resources and uh, uh, kind of support to take this, uh, take the benefit or take the kind of uh, uh, gains from this, uh, the change educational kind of scenario. So therefore, they all argue that it is, the, from human rights and social exclusion perspective, they argue that it is creating a kind of a new kind of uh, uh, glaring inequality and perpetuating, kind of perpetuating the kind of uh, uh, digital divide so and also the rights of the poor rights of the underprivileged rights of the backward uh, kind of population students their rights actually is being uh, under threat or it is being questioned and it is not being addressed the third approach which we also uh, know that is a kind of capability approach and they argue that is basically the development economists and uh, experts and also some of these uh, uh, kind of reformers in a sense. They argue that this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to improve the capability of all these stakeholders. This is an opportunity. They have a kind of optimistic view that the, all the teachers, they get an opportunity to how to use online technology, how to make that teaching more effective with the support of this online technology, even when the normalcy is resumed, when this pandemic situation also is uh, restored or, or it is uh, it disappears. So that that way teachers, they can improve, the, there, there is a chance, it's an opportunity for them to improve their capability. And so also the students, those who actually though did not know or those who are not, not familiar with this online technologies, how to make the education, learning and teaching practices uh, more effective, they also get an opportunity. And similarly, the state itself also is getting an opportunity how to address these inequalities and how to improve the uh, its capacity to address these uh, uh, the new requirements and how to reach the poor, how to reach the underprivileged and how to make the educational system more effective, uh, both the online and offline mode. And they are now exploring the merits of these online technologies. So this is the point is that actually all these perspectives, there are also many other kind of uh, kind of approaches and perspectives. You know, I am just outlining some of the broad kind of uh, uh, perspectives. But if you see all these, the, these three perspectives, they are not also sufficient enough to capture these complexities. And if you see the narratives which are there in the newspapers, which you often see in the television reports, uh, print media, electronic media, and other also uh, kind of uh, quick assessment or short studies which are being reported, we, what we find that different kind of experiences, and it is it cannot be documented, it cannot be explained only through these uh, uh, perspectives or through these uh, approaches. So we need to actually go beyond this thing and also try to see that how the new concepts and how kind of new tools are required to understand the situation and address these challenges. And in the, all these varied experiences need to be theorized further and need to be conceptualized in a kind of different way. So I, our this webinar has Thank opened you, and taken, has opened a kind of a, uh, uh, sir, sorry? Dean, a uh, director has also joined, sir. A director has also joined, so I just, okay. sorry for the interruption, he has joined, sir. So I finish with the oh, right. Yes, sir. Okay. So then uh, this is a kind of a new situation. You all these things need to be understood and theorized and conceptualized further. So this webinar, it has opened a kind of a window and a good initiative and it must be taken forward. So, and I am sure this validation now, which we are going to have uh, the, the presentations from the 
valid to speaker and uh, the, our director of culture and cultural relations and uh, other uh, dignitaries it will add to the further richness of this today's deliberations so with this i will move on to the pleasant task of welcoming our guests for this session first of all i would like to welcome our director professor rajiv jain director of culture and cultural relations of pondicherry university he is the pro vice chancellor of this university as a person i need not say those who are from pondicherry university they very well he is one of the finest gentlemen i have actually ever seen and he is a noted educationist and outstanding scholar and moreover very helpful and employee friendly administrator so and he has been supporting all the departments in university all the faculty in all our academic endeavors he is very helpful and supportive i am happy that he agreed to grace this occasion and preside over this valedictory function on the behalf of the department of sociology and the school of social science and international studies i extend a very warm and hearty welcome to you sir now i would like to welcome professor navanita roth who will be delivering the valedictory address i know personally as well as professionally for a quite long time she is currently the professor of sociology at utkal university bhubaneswar she was the head of the department for quite long time now she is heading the center for women studies she has done extensive work on the diverse areas of development sociology and particularly particularly on gender studies i know she has organized number of useful academic events training programs and uh, many other kind of uh, good academic kind of activities to uh, which is which are helpful for the students for the policy makers and for the uh, so, uh, public at large and she has been working very hard for the improvement of the discipline and also the department in the uh, utkal university and in recognition of her contribution of her understanding of the society and culture particularly of odisha the government of odisha recently appointed her as one of the members of the obc commission and she has been the regular consultant as a sociologist to the on many uh, occasions and she has been providing policy inputs and i know her she is very good and you know many of our students also go there for phd program and some of their students also come here and the, the all the students invariably they appreciate her and they uh, rate her that she is one of the very very friendly student friendly teacher very popular teacher very good researcher very good scholar and on top of it i would say that she is an ideal woman so i am very happy that uh, she has agreed to deliver this valedictory address on this webinar and uh, on the behalf of the sociology school of social sciences and international studies i and pandicherry university in the, uh, i extend a very warm welcome to madam then i also welcome professor murthy the dean of the school of social sciences and international studies who is probably not seen is not actually not not a joint also welcome him, welcome him he is a very supportive person and very helpful uh, so far for our department for many activities he has extended a very supporting and helping hand i am really thankful to him and i extend a kind of a special welcome to you to you professor murthy i also welcome the, uh, the organizer of this two days webinar dr aruna she has been working very hard and made it a kind of grand success invited good spec uh, set of speakers and very uh, meticulously very systematically she organized this event i welcome her and also i take this opportunity to welcome all the resource persons and uh, particularly uh, the the, uh, uh, the the resource persons who are actually present today uh, and Uh, the colleagues from our department, uh, Professor Dastagiri, 
Dr. Parira, Dr. Imti, Dr. Mansi, and also the colleagues from other department, uh, Dr. Srikala and others, I don't see them on screen, whosoever I'm seeing, I'm just mentioning their names. So I welcome one and all. Thank you so much. Let us have a kind of a fruitful session. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for this very uh, elaborate and uh, you really made uh, this welcome a uh, really heartwarming welcome. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now we will uh, move on to the presidential address. Uh, we have with us here the Director of Culture and Cultural Relations, Professor Ajib Jain, um, uh, Pondicherry University. Uh, as you all know, he is one of the key pillars of our university and everyone would love working with him, as Professor Moti has already stated for his simplicity and kindness. And uh, he belongs to a dis discipline of chemistry, but still he's a very disciplined person and remains, a, uh, and he is a very important advisor to both for the university as well as the individual level to all the employees. Um, and he also is a key person in buffering many of the problems. Uh, so thank you, sir, for um, accepting our invitation and your presence is is really uh, important for us because you give all the best blessings and wishes to us. Thank you for joining, and we now request you to give the presidential address. Thank you, madam, for your kind words. It is Professor Mohanty, head department of sociology, Professor Murthy, dean, school of social sciences and international studies, Dr. Aruna. Convener of the webinar, Professor Navnita Rath, today's special guest and uh, valid, uh, to be delivered valid, valid, uh, validly delivered by her from Utkal University, participants, fellow colleagues, and dear students. It is my, it is my pleasure to be here with you on the occasion of webinar on responding to COVID-19 school education and its stakeholders. This webinar is a timely arranged web webinar on a subject of importance to all because we are parents, our schools are, our children are go, start going, maybe starting going physically to schools. So there are various things in, in case of pandemic, which occurred about 100 days, Spanish flu, then there was a rupture and again there was a new society. And so after that, when this pandemic will be over soon, as expected, by way of some medicine, vaccine or by herd immunity, as may be the case, then there will be a new thinking and new society. So I am reading a few words from well-known author, starting Arundhati Roy. According to, I quote her, historically, pandemic have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one, one world and the next. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists, nothing could be worse than a return to normality. We do not want to return to normality, but a new world. We want to start with a new world on the basis of which you have organized this webinar. What should be the new world? What should be the things which we will foresee to come in the future? The COVID-19 pandemic has fundamentally changed many aspects of our world, including the way we teach. Our emergence from the pandemic provides an opportunity for deep reflection and intentional action about what we teach and why as well as how we facilitate students' learning. Focusing on fundamental secondary courses, 
we suggest that we cannot simply return to normal practice but need to design and implement new ways learning based on fundamentally reimagined reimagined learning outcomes for our courses that equip students for life after the rupture they have they have experienced new learning objective should be guided both by an analysis of existing global challenges and the type of understanding and the practices needed to confirm them and by research based framework that provide insights into important area of knowledge skill and attitude development a core set of competition along three major dimensions that is cross cutting reasoning core understanding and fundamental practices should guide the design implementation and evolution of curricula teaching practices and assessment in foundational courses for science engineering arts social sciences and all during the 2020 pandemic we and our students have been witness to unprecedented changes and surprising behaviors these are the need to live with complexity exceptionally rapid change or uncertainty fear and vulnerability the remarkable human capacity for resilience in responding to the overnight disruption of long established patterns of working living and social communications the disproportionate the disproportionate effect of the pandemic on vulnerable socio economic groups including seniors in homeless and refugee population and those living in densely populated mega cities and coastal areas the paradox of scientific advisors stepping up to cameras to provide vital knowledge and nurture tr trust relied on by many political leaders but dismissed by others this has highlighted the, that evidence and data matters and the importance of equipping citizens to filter information including an informatic of false reports on social media and make their own informal evidence based decisions the urgent need for the public to build competencies in understanding quantitative strengths and limitations of models and visual representations of interrelated varieties such as susceptible infected and recovered populations the positive impact of the painful global shutdown on our planet's life support systems on what would have considered an impossible time at the beginning of the 2020 here is clear and breathable in many of our global mega cities wildlife has returned to urban and industrial habitats much less disturbed by vehicles and industrial activities global greenhouse gas emissions are plunging to levels of 10 years ago the largest drop recorded in a year and twice as large as the combined of all reductions since the end of world war 2 yet proportional annual average atmospheric carbon dioxide levels will still increase through 2020 just at a slower rate means along with negative aspect of the pandemic there are many positive aspects we have read in newspapers that the greenhouse effect is less carbon dioxide emissions are less now our rivers are clean because we have stopped we have closed the industrial activities now we have learned that if we want to do industrial activity we have to do with the provisions to remove to treat the pollutants that they may not pollute our air soil and water again in that way in that in what ways will the experiences of our students in courses as we taught them before and during the pandemic have equipped them to make sense of and adapt to these 
startling changes and behaviors. What learning experiences have helped them understand how insights can provide us to pressing social and environmental questions? What structural activities have developed students' decision-making skills and ability to deal with complexity and rapid change informed by understanding of the interrelationship among chemical reactions and processes and societal and environmental systems. Focusing on experience of students in fundamental courses, we reflect here on how the world of our students' experience changed during the 2020 pandemic and how education has responded to these changes. We then identify the need to reimagine to reimagine what we do to equip students for life after the rupture they have experienced. Finally, it is suggested that communities might take up to implement new learning and learning based on reimagined learning objectives rather than unquestionably returning to the old normal. We need not to return to normal as was the case before the pandemic. But we have to change, we have to think how we can work, how we how, how our students can work in the new era, in the future after the rupture, rupture which we have seen. After that, how we what we can do for our students, how we can frame our curricula so that their thinking is changed. They can think in a new direction, they can think they can imagine in a new direction, so far they have not. They are, they, so far they are only focused on the basis that teacher will come in the class, he, will, he or she will teach the students, there will be a fixed curriculum, questions will be asked and an answer will be given in uh, answer book. But now the after the pandemic, all things will change, there will be a future, again new me there. So I congratulate the organizers for particularly uh, Dr. Aruna for organizing a, such a timely webinar which have given us to think about the future after the rupture, after the pandemic and also given me an opportunity to read about the uh, these things, uh, what will be the social impact of pandemic uh, and we can compare what was the thing before the pandemic and how the things have changed after pandemic. This study will be well, uh, well, will frame a topic for different types of studies and also will give a new impetus to the uh, research and framing the new curricula for our students. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you for putting everything in the in a nutshell and telling us how we, we need to move forward uh, and touched upon all areas which we, what we had been discussing in the last few days. Thank you for that, sir. Thank you. And with your wishes, we will move on to the next part of the program. Thank you, sir. Um, now, in the, in the last two days, we have been uh, listening to speakers who made a in own way and giving their ideas. To consolidate and to highlight the key points to take forward, uh, we have with us uh, Professor Namnita Rath, who is, uh, as already Professor Mohanty had already mentioned, and uh, you know you know the, her position, but she is the faculty of the Department of Sociology, Uttal University, and she also heads the Center for Women's Studies, and she has done plenty, a lot of writing, and uh, you know she keeps uh, uh, you know tuned to many of the debates and other uh, discussions. Uh, we are indeed very fortunate that she is here with us. Who accept, she accepted our invitation to be part of this program and provide her insights as well. Uh, today, though it would be a keynote address, uh, her focus would be um, a valedictory address. Her focus would be on inclusivity in school education, post-COVID-19 period, rethinking strategies. I think Madam is taking forward from what Director has said, um, and I'm sure this would be a very interesting uh, lecture to listen to and uh, fruitful information will be provided to the process. Madam, we are very happy that you joined us for the program. Uh, uh, I request you to give us the validity address. Please. Yeah. 
madam is it visible yes madam yes, it is yes, visible yes. yes the presentation yes. is visible esteemed convener of this webinar dr aruna head of the department sociology pondicherry university and my very intimate friend professor mohanty all faculty friends from the department of sociology pondicherry university which is very close to me and my co panelist professor jain who spoke just before me professor murthy in absentia all the uh, student friends and teacher friends who have joined this uh, digital platform and the participants who are also participating i want to express my gratitude to the convener and the organizing committee of this webinar for organizing as professor jain said a very timely uh, topic that is on school education and the very thing that actually struck to me being in higher education we often ignore and neglect school education so it is really startling how it occurred to the minds of the organizing committee to have a, a webinar on this school education this is the valedictory session as i understand and by now a lot many ideas and arguments might have emerged in the on the issue yesterday i attended a part of it and today i attended since the last presenter they were presenting their research articles and um, research uh, um, uh, insights and in, uh, during that period i felt that much of it has been covered i just want to say some of my ideas which may be also duplications and my topic as and i should say that the generous uh, introduction given by professor mahanti and professor aruna is actually i will candidly submit before you i do not deserve all that it is because of some personal link they have given such an introduction and on school education also i will be going on a very superficial way because i haven't done actually real studies on school education during those days so my topic is inclusivity in school education in post covid 19 period and rethinking strategies when we talk about school education i want to make a start by saying that school is a very powerful institution i think undeniably everyone will agree with me this is the institution which creates the real capital that is needed to increase our gnp and gdp because this is the institution which creates what is say physical capital which is responsible for generating financial capital which actually instills social capital among the students it generates human capital and it generates what we are telling the knowledge capital required for the knowledge revolution we are undergoing in the present millennium so when all these capitals are being generated by this institution this is a powerful institution long acknowledged by the western countries and some countries from our eastern side like japan korea have also well acknowledged it therefore the international community has taken inclusivity in education as a priority in their agenda and there are many commitments and we will discuss what are the achievements and how covid 19 has affected this these achievements the unesco convention against discrimination in education 1960 it is almost 60 years back and other international human rights treaties prohibit exclusion from admission to educational opportunities on the basis of any socially ascribed differences and recently from 2015 sdg goal 4 also focuses on education and the education framework for action 2030 agenda emphasizes on inclusion and equity because inclusion is done to bring 
equity and they say that is the cornerstone of quality education today we are not talking about general we are talking another with a prefix to it that is quality education and if we see these are the commitments achievements if we see by the end of 2018, about 258 million children were out of school, according to UNESCO. And among these 258 million, there are 59 million children are in the primary school age group, 62 million are in the lower secondary school age, and 138 million are in upper secondary age. And if you see, as the level goes up, how the in exclusion goes on increasing and keeping this in view actually we thought about inclusive education and when we talk about inclusive education what is this simply speaking inclusive education is when all students regardless of any challenge they may have are placed in the age appropriate general education classes to receive high quality instructions inventions supports that enable them to meet the success in core curriculum we are now enrolling students but many of them are enrolled in an overage so that is not exactly inclusiveness and we do not give quality education to all and therefore both enrollment is required at the same time age appropriateness is required and the third one is quality is also required there is a concept called LRE, least restrictive environment so that is applicable to your um, inclusiveness students receive their education in the least restrictive environment if a school there are stigmas if there are discriminations in a school system, then we can cannot say it is inclusive education. So successive uh, inclusive education happens primarily through accepting, understanding, and attending to student differences and diversity. Students are biologically or physically and socially they are diverse. That we have to celebrate. That we have to understand, and which include they are different. Uh, we find difference in their physical ability, cognitive skill, in their academic performance, in their social background, and in their emotional manifestations. So these things we have to take into consideration and in the school em environment we have to synchronize them and balance them in such a nice way that will lead to what is uh, what i uh, inclusive education the world community says there are seven principles of inclusivity and what are they teaching all students all because education is the right of every child but right i should say and 2009 right to education speaks of that exploring multiple identities we should not try to overshadow the identities and to bring them into a uniform identity diversity needs to be celebrated we have to celebrate multiculturalism we have to celebrate the diverse identities they have and third thing is that we have to prevent prejudices when we teach in a school we find there are many prejudices that's out the minds of the teachers girls cannot do good mathematics a tribal child cannot understand the general principles that we are teaching but we never introspect what lie defect lies with us so that the, it is not reachable to the child then promoting social justice education is a resource it should be equally distributed to ensure social justice and appropriate materials should be taken so that the child can use them, handle them. And teaching and learning about cultures and religions, this, this is the most vital one. I will give you an example here. In the madrasas, we never teach about other religions and culture. So also when we talk about saponization of education, we also try to avoid other cultures and other religions. No. When we are promoting, there should not be a dominant culture predominating our school education system. Right from the childhood, the primer should be so composed that 
it should accommodate all cultures and religions that will develop a tolerance among the children and will uh, erode a number of issues of social issues. And the last one is adapting and integrating getting the lessons appropriately. We should not take it in an haphazard way. It is it should be a building up process that will develop the cognitive that will enrich the real cognitivity of the child. That is called inclusive education. So if you know these seven principles, now we have to discuss how the pandemic has affected this inclusive education. If I say when we say stakeholders, I have also written here students, parents, educators, but the greatest stakeholder is the state itself, who, which is going to be affected at the end. It is the state and society. So students, parents, educators, they have the ripple effect of the novel coronavirus because the, we, the when this virus started taking a pandemic character when 30, on 31st of January, the WHO declared it as a pandemic. So the non-pharmaceutical interventions were thought of in the form of social distancing, lockdowns, and closure of And school closure has kept around 90% of their students worldwide, 1.57 billion out of school and cost over 370 million children to miss out their schools. Out of these uh, out of school children, out of school children, nearly 743 million are girls. There is a gender dimension into it and over 11 million of these girls are living in the world's least developed countries and therefore again an economic part is also here and there is the development dichotomy again has crept into this syndrome pandemic has brought a learning poverty my dear friends i want to tell here about learning poverty because this is the worst the wretched form of poverty economic poverty can be revived but learning poverty once it takes it culminates and it accumulates as we increase with our age so with the progression of age this poverty goes on showing its worst form that learning poverty it has created and i have given two quotes here one on the Ebola crisis, when Ebola crisis came and it was schools were left empty as abundant nests and it was localized, it was for a time being, it was not for such an elongated period and as we know this pandemic has got across geographies and no geopolitical boundaries it has got across and therefore today's children and adolescents grow up to see themselves as a lost generation when we see whose lives will forever fall in the shadow of a global thing. I was talking to you about learning poverty and now I am talking to you about a lost generation. If a generation is lost, you see what type of jerk the society is going to face and therefore it is very important to see the pan and pandemic has created not only school closure impact on education but it has created social exclusion in a country like india because unicef has revealed that covid 19 pandemic in india and lockdown has impacted to 47 million children enrolled in elementary and secondary schools and 28 million children going to preschool education in anganwadi centers I, I am very very keen to tell you here the schools in india we say qualitatively they are poor no but they serve a lot of purposes they give many habits to the students they give a ventilating ambience to the students they give midday meal to the students so they serve nutritional educational habitual many aspects of the students and the no doubt the central and the state government have been very very proactive they have introduced multiple e-platforms like web portals mobile apps tv channels radios podcasts to reach the children Diksha platform, Swayam Prabha TV channel, e repository to open educational, to provide educational resources. But is it sufficient? Is it a good response for the resilience of the excluded? 
Now, question is that educational, the, in response, the educational experts describe them. They are the imperfect substitutes. Nothing can substitute. None of these digital platform is a good substitute for our schooling system. This is because of the diverse nature of schooling and diverse categories of students. This may work home good in the Western countries, which are quite developed, but in a country like India, where there are diverse schooling systems are there and diverse categories of students are there, it has not worked well. And before this, Professor Mahanti was telling how digital devices and divide has shown itself during this pandemic and it has become a matter of concern and when i am talking about the school types of schools in india we find four types of schools according to me and these are and the clientels are different and the capacity of schools as well as the clientele are also different the first group is the government funded public schools which are based on the principles of accessibility equity and quality government schools always try to hit upon equity and quality they want to ensure as much as they can to the most marginalized section of the society and there are about 11 lakh to uh, 2783 children in this category and children from marginal and poor but their infrastructure is poor because they are only to cater the needs to increase the enrollment at the grassroots level and the second is the privately managed vernacular and special schools where equity and quality are taken care of 2 lakh 24 thousand 552 students are enrolled there and children from little better communities like your mars Saraswati Sisu Mandir, Mahasri Vidya Mandir, all these come in this category. The CAL is computer aided learning. There is medium infrastructure in these schools because they collect little amount of money and there is, but there is no computer aided learning in these types of schools. The third category comes the private English medium schools, which in, uh, started with a mission to ensure quality and the um, number of students is only 1,7758 and children from middle to higher class are the goers to of this school and they have pretty good infrastructure. They have responded to this pandemic and to the digital platform teaching pattern and the last is the international where children from post class or elite, the financial tycoon, children of the financial tycoons they attend, they have the best infrastructure and they have, but the number is always smaller for these two schools which have actually responded to the digital mode of teaching. And there are again some amplifying factors. The amplifying factors are difference across school systems in their capacity to design, implement effective education responses during exigencies through remote learning. All the schools could not actually respond to the digital learning and the second thing before me in the first uh, in the previous session the researchers they were from teas they were telling how teachers were diverted so this created a vacuum in the learning and the second thing is the difference in the quality of children because there are children of special needs who cannot do many things like therapy and the special teaching the special educational instructors they were not available during the period the second thing was the difference among the students in their resilience capacity motivation and skill to learn independently and online children as such small children they do not have motivation they do not have resilience only those who are put into very competitive environment our parental pressure they try to become resilient and they are motivated and they have the skill to learn independently and online teaching they can adhere to but other children cannot do that and difference among system among students in the support from parents 
because parents have to financially support them for digital learning parents have to provide them academic support parents have to provide them motivational support these things are not uh, lacking among many parents as a result of which children going to schools in the first two categories of schools suffer the worst and the third one is dependence degrees and dimensions if we see i told you indian schools cater to the needs of the marginalized multi pronged uh, dimensions the first is they provide mid day meal they are responsible for habit formations they are responsible for personality development there is a peer pressure through which the child becomes competitive health checkups are taken up in the schools extracurricular activities are taught to the child which he cannot take up in the home front particularly a poor marginalized child competitive environment therapies ventilating environment lab lab library supplements this is also the case for the first two types of schools i had discussed so all these th things became the missing elements when there was school closure during the pandemic so the excluded started becoming ultra excluded ultra exclusion already excluded became the syndrome particularly we take the these categories as the excluded ones the girls the are the common left outs as we know and the refugees displaced children they are the nowhere population they do not have a geographical uh, confinement or contour within which they go for teaching and uh, their learning and they became the worst affected then the children with disabilities who are the last entrance the government was trying to motivate them to bring come to school and all that they suffered a lot because their special instructors and the school environment was missing the instruments environment instructors all these were missing children affected by trauma and mental health issues they were the special school goers they also missed the school and learning opportunities migrants minorities marginalized they are the sporadic attenders and the government had made a very good progress by integrating them into the school system and they became excluded gradually and after this the situation will be again very difficult for them to re uh, to again um, uh, adjust with the school system and the socially disadvantaged people like the dalits adivasis and the obc community people so now the question uh, arises and as i heard uh, i read in a global health journal the reduction in the routine health service coverage levels disruption in life saving immunization activities which are also taken up in the preschool as well as in some primary schools i will lead to an increase in child wasting up to 3 lakh children could die in india alone in the next 6 month this is a very alarming um, indication given to us and food insecurity as mid day meal is pre food insecurity among children will be growing the child rights we were telling that that is the right to participation right for development uh, and the uh, all right to life all this will be affected because around 9 7 billion children across 1.1 million schools in india depend on mid day meals and this will lead to child it has already started child marriages have started trafficking has started beggary you will find on the streets child labor has been people and parents are using the children as labor into the labor force pushing into the level force illicit activities engaging them in illicit activities to earn their living and deficit training and education for the blind deaf autistic children will lead to more precarious condition among them so now the question comes how we will strategize so that we can overcome all these issues in the post covid 19 period and for that we need to first recover from the trauma that the school system has actually witnessed then we have to prepare ourselves because ourselves because the time has come covid has given us an experience so we have to now prepare ourselves because in future we never know whether a more virulent pandemic may also affect the society as well as the school system and third thing we should develop healthy coping mechanisms and for that five things we need to know 
the first is the availability of some basic things we have to do then accessibility we have to increase thirdly affordability capacity of all the stakeholders need to increase fourth is quality we have to ensure and the fifth one is we have to see utility aspect also it should not end with quality but it should be some utility have utilitarian value and for that four things we need to actually divide one is with the individuals we have to bring some changes with the institutions we have to bring institutional changes we have to bring in instructional changes and finally we need to bring infrastructure change. so so far as individuals are concerned now the time has come to leverage our teachers even as university teachers we were not that much comfortable with digital mode of teaching in the first in the march when we actually said the closure started shutdown started we were giving pdf files to our students in the next uh, two three months we could leverage ourselves now we are taking online classes and students are joining each so we have to now leverage the school teacher we have to leverage the parents we have to leverage the communities to reinvent their roles from that of transferring information to enabling learning we normally in our schools we adhere to the information transformation system that should not be the pedagogy the pedagogy needs to change we have made, make the students competent that they should be empowered for self learning digital training and skilling of the students parents csos even and community members and leaders is needed because they will come as the vacuum filler when there is a pandemic of this sort and there is school closure then promote Promoting self-learning among students is very important, as we know. In the Indian schools, we make the students very, very dependent. We spoon feed them. That spoon feeding should be withdrawn at this moment and providing opportunities to learn from diverse resources. The resources is not only digital and digitalization is the only resource they can learn from their environment. How to learn to it's introduced creative learning is important the third is recruitment of digital volunteers to teach in a village suppose parents are illiterate but younger generation the youth they are at least they are digitally literate so we can recruit them as volunteers during this period so that the entire education system should not be as mass but they can continue with the system and we can engage a young people as education volunteers they can make doorstep and um, they can collect the students they can go to doorstep they can assign give assignments if the teachers are diverted so the next is we have to go for institutional changes like we have to change the now the time has not come to go for concretizing our school buildings what is important is to create media labs with instructors a recruitment of counselors in each school for training the students and parents because counselors role now is found to be very important and it is a missing element in most of the schools only those in um, the for international schools and the public schools english medium schools which take a um, higher amount of money they provide counselors but counselor post needs to be created and there should be a platform for children to connect among themselves and express and share their views and provide flexible learning catch up courses now catch up courses is required because already they have lost 8 months and accelerated learning for the minority marginalized migrant and girls is required because they are the people they are not returning to school after that we educational planners know because with lots of difficulty with lots of struggle they have brought them to into the ambit of the school system the third thing is that in order to do that we have to incentivize them 
take home lessons should be introduced school meals ex extending to include breakfast and social protection will also be an attraction for them make schools access point for psychology psychosocial support and food distribution need for increased capacities at kostaba gandhi balika vidyalayas to bring the girls and the tribal hostels and in some communities cash transfers can also be used to attract and keep the vulnerable children like adolescent girls in schools this is the need of the hour that we have to think about the third transformation we need in the instructional pattern in the three things in the teaching in the assessment and information to knowledge we have to go so first is we have to liberate learning from the out uh, outdated curricula we have got very fixed curricula we do not have flexible curricula we have standardized curriculum for the entire state but we should develop local specific curriculum which can be done without this standardized curriculum but empowering the child and giving up the centuries old chalk talk talking a uh, teaching model we believe in chalk talk teaching model and we have to now move from chalk talk to technology driven the uh, teaching the teaching and assessment methodology is also need a transformation and the third is that disproportionate emphasis on information transfer should be uh, avoided because we give lot of stress on information transfer we never give importance on creating knowledge knowledge is empowering knowledge in, empowers the child information always overloads the child and the last one is what is in, in infrastructural things need a so digital uh, learning solutions learning management software should be adopted so teacher can conduct teaching online in normal times also they need to acquaint the these uh, online uh, systems the diksha platform will reach across all states can further strengthen to ensure accessibility of learning to the students and adoption of low tech and gender responsive approaches is needed because we have to think about gender because i told you now the exclusion has a pervasive gender dimension send reading writing material so use radio television broadcast to reach the most marginalized allow self paced learning not to deter the girls who often disproportionately shoulder the burden of care work therefore what we do we should not make it very timely that you have to come to the school uh, we have to make it flexi learning we have to introduce now and vocationalization of education and and training through instructional guides we should be the focus of the schools all these things actually can bring a change and inclusivity in school education as per my view and with this i wrap up thank you if you have any question i am there to answer thank you hello hello yes a very yeah. good presentation very good excellent presentation we all enjoyed it it was a very small presentation uh, okay hello aruna hello hello aruna hello Aruna Madam is there. She has to unmute herself. Ah, uh -huh. I think. Hello. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Please join. She is asking. Yeah, yeah. Please. Okay. Um. Sorry that there was a, a connectivity loss. Um. I am sorry for that. 
Uh, anyway, these are the problems that we are facing as part of this uh, digital transformation. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. You're okay. Okay. All right, all right. <clears throat> okay, sir. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I just couldn't uh, get back on time. Okay, so uh, actually, when I listened to Madam Navneeta this weekend, I am sure all of you agree with me that we had a very comprehensive presentation, and also she provided us the input as to how to move forward. In fact, she touched upon. Uh, gave a uh, you know summarized version of what we have discussed and how we can uh, take it forward. She touched upon the heterogeneity of the students and also the uh, the principles for the inclusive education. And also she uh, emphasized on the tolerance that we need to that the our children need to have to uh, to even uh, to mold them at an younger younger age. These are important even at the ordinary stages. She also uh, emphasizes on the role of the, of the state. She emphasizes on the importance of the state and society. How it has to, what is the role it has to play, and also how it can also get impacted as a result of this problem. Uh, Madam has also given us the uh, importance of the gender dimension, which not many speakers have touched upon. Madam, thank you for highlighting upon that, and also trying to, you know. Uh, to express the deeper inequalities that has come up as a result of this pandemic, um, and your and the strategies that you have given are also very practical. That also the four eyes has been very very important, and I'm sure all the other uh, the presenters, other members, participants here would get the crux of what we have been discussing. Thank you for such a wonderful lecture. Thank you, madam. Uh, it has been a, a delight listening to you. Thank you for that. If at all somebody has a few questions, maybe uh, they can put it up in the chat box, and we can uh, send it across to Madam so that you can also get connected. Actually, Madam, thank you. Yes, sir. Valedictory address actually we should not raise any question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The reason why. Yes, sir. True, sir. I agree. Yes, sir. Uh, because. Uh, I, I thought Madam uh, had put it up in the slide, so I thought probably if uh, somebody wanted to, yes, yes, they, they can. can. They wish they can write to her also and send her questions. Right. So we, will so we will send it across later, sir. We'll okay. send it across later. We will not take it up right now. Um, so with that, I moved to the last part of this program. And thankfully, I got the connection back. Otherwise, I was just wondering how we would conclude this two-day wonderful webinar. So thanks to the uh, uh, the connection again. So I, I would um, also sum up the report. And uh, I also would like to thank from the, from the organizers part. Um, I'm indeed proud to express that we had a very interesting and fruitful webinar focusing on issues related to handling of the school education and attempting a deeper examination of the role of the stakeholders. The webinar gave us a very important inputs and right direction for uh, not just researchers, but also for the school institution and the state to take forward. The webinar discussions highlighted the changing roles of the authority and the changing needs of the changing needs of the stakeholders for which the society is yet to be prepared. The webinar started off with the inaugural session and was presided by the director of studies and felicitated by our team. We had the inaugural address by Professor Nagraju from Hyderabad University, and he brought in the public uh, private divide uh, public private dichotomy in schools and also explain how this, uh, how the survival of the fittest theory operates more in the current situation. We also, um, he also, uh, we also had a special address in the same session by Professor Padma Sarangapani from Tata Institute of Social Sciences. She neatly laid the connectivity between the theory and practice and gave a very comprehensive approach again regarding the new educational policy and also the right to education. Um, and also in this, uh, and also try to relate it to the COVID-19 situation. And she again emphasized on the state role, teachers, teacher and the family role, and how uh, the parents do not take the role of the teacher, but need to play their role individually. So, uh, and also to rethink about the whole concept of education. So um, we also had the, uh, and so this was part of the inaugural session. Later we had the technical session, which was moderated by uh, Dr. Parita. Uh, we had uh, Professor Tataswami Tatomasi Palta Singh from Sambalpur University, who elaborated on the nuances in school education during the COVID. 
and how one has to be uh, one has to respond and also be prepared uh, she also picturized the role of all stakeholders very vividly and interlinked the need uh, need for a relook at the existing situation we also had a field presentation on different learning and the role of parents during the covid-19 by professor ankur madan from azim premji university she agreed that the parents had a higher role to play uh, and a larger role to play especially in the situation and this apart, I mean, apart from the um, uh, and they need to play the role of a uh, uh, you know, teacher assistant so, and it was also a very inter uh, interesting presentation from a psychological perspective and also from the uh, develop uh, from the um, child uh, develop perspective uh, we also had another important speaker uh, mrs pachimoy who was from the ground level who spoke about uh, the real um, challenges and also how the challenges can be converted to opportunities so she also explained the, uh, you know, the practical ways by which the they address the children they didn't only focus on the curriculum but they also tried to you know to develop the overall personality it was also interesting um, and um, you know how um, important uh, uh, it is uh, uh, to look at um, Uh, you know the state intervention too. So the state is also playing an important role, and how the teachers and the institutions were um, facing the uh, problems. So she narrated in detail and also, um, you know, exp uh, expressed their experiences with us. Uh, in uh, today's uh, day two was a uh, also very very interesting uh, day, which with which we had with uh, Professor Disha Navani from um, just so the second today's. Uh, session started off with um, uh, Dr. Sadisha Dawani of Jean School of um, Education Tata Institute of Social Sciences and we also had um, other speakers um, Dr. Shrikala um, Dr. Belu Megra Shubhi Nakpal and Ankit Sharma um, uh, I'm sure all of those who are uh, currently participating had also had the opportunity to listen to um, all the speakers um, it was a very interesting day and um, uh, they all uh, provided um, you know the details especially um, professor dishad dishad navani uh, tried to focus on how um, you know the schooling uh, the interlink between um, you know the schooling the policy and also we really look at the whole um, you know way by which we address the children um, and also um, you know, questioning the education system itself um, and uh, uh, you know the presentation was um, uh, you know at the event uh, Uh, um, a very uh, insightful uh, it was an insightful lecture and um, i'm sure um, it had uh, really received a lot of laurels for that apart from that we also had dr shrikala who focused on um, uh, mitigating the widening inequality in learning opportunities during covid-19 and use of supplementary pedagogy in schooling here again uh, uh, madam had highlighted uh, had tried to bring in the the very differences and whatever we have discussed now in the valedictory was also brought up there um uh, but we also had portions of that and i think the the final valedictory address had tried to pull everything together and we had a very holistic understanding and shikala had also mentioned all of that and also tried to bring out the various pedagogies that can be used to address these uh, limitations um and we also had dr bailu mera who had been focusing on the psycho spiritual insights of from um, holistic well being of learners and teachers and this particular uh, presentation focused on Uh, you know uh, the left out areas where we are not giving um, an importance to the um, the inner self and how both the teachers and the children had to uh, you know introspect and especially the teachers need to introspect and how the connect has to be laid so all that was, was um, expressed there was expressed in the presentation it was a very very useful presentation we also had the two young sirs shubhi nakpal and ankit i'm sure they are also here as participants even now uh, you know they had a we had a wonderful presentation by them so it was uh, a pure research based article and gave valid insights uh, or it gave uh, it described the situation what's happening right now and how we need to immediately react to the situations and especially how the teachers are being exploited in the process and how uh, you know the the the, the teachers uh, you know says several programs can be connected to the teachers so, uh, this was also a very very uh, interesting presentation and i need to thank uh, uh, dr imti had uh, coordinated the session um, and it was a uh, i'm sure all of you agree with me that it was a very, very interesting session so this was part of the um, the two day happenings and um, it's uh, we end this uh, webinar with complete satisfaction that we had a diverse um, 
uh, you know, array of diverse uh, views and uh, also it was not just talking about problems but also how to address it, how, to, how we need to rethink ourselves. It also gave several useful information to the students as to how to look at their research and how to uh, bring in these theory and um, issues into their, you know, this, their research problems as well. So it was, I personally feel this was a success because we had very good speakers and also they were serious in trying to convey uh, the reality. Uh, thank, uh, so that's it. So I'm also uh, using this opportunity to thank, uh, thank all of the, thank uh, the speakers and others in this webinar. So as part of, uh, I think that was part of the summation of the uh, happenings. I now move on to formally thank uh, uh, all the uh, members who have been part of this uh, webinar. First and foremost, I would like to thank our university administration for providing us the uh, the platform and the space for conducting this webinar. The moment we came up with this, uh, the direct uh, vice chancellor, right from vice chancellor to uh, the directors and the others, other important authorities in the administration, have been provided a very very supportive um, uh, environment for us, and so that we could conduct this webinar. We also uh, I'm also thankful uh, to uh, Dean uh, Professor Murthy, uh, who had been there with us yesterday, and but given his wishes today, uh, he has also been very supportive, and we were able to um, have a completion with this program with his support. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity um, to thank um, uh, the inaugural address um, the speaker, uh, the inaugural address speaker, uh, Professor Nagaraju. Who, um, despite short notice, he immediately agreed to come and um, you know give the um, inaugural address, and it was a very very useful um, address for that or address for the uh, listeners, and also uh, 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 to start off with. And thank uh, thank you for that person, and also on behalf of the department. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank all the uh, I mean the the, the present speaker. Uh, the valedictory address speaker, Professor Namdeen Dharat, who again, uh, she, uh, she is both professionally and personally very supportive to us. And uh, uh, despite we have a personal connection, that's one part, but then apart from that, professionally also, we have a very strong connect with that and uh, with her. And we're very happy that you joined for this valedictory address. And it was such a wonderful lecture that we could listen to. Um, I would also like to move on to the other speakers. We uh, had in the morning, the special address was by Professor Patma Sarangapani. Um, uh, we know that uh, she is a very active and um, busy person, but despite that, she was here to give the address, and uh, we thank her uh, again on this. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, again, and also would like to thank the rest of the speakers. Um, yesterday, uh, we had uh, uh, Professor Pala, Professor Thomasi Palta Singh, who uh, specializes in this area and we really want her to be on board and she was with us she immediately agreed we thank her for that we also would like to thank Ankur Madan for her uh, support and being here and, and it was a long way home, but despite that she was here with us and and, uh, and all her content was such a useful uh, material for us and I thank her on stay I also would like to thank um, Mrs. Pachiamal uh, who had been um, uh, who, 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 who is part of the Azim Premji University um, uh, circus study group um, who was part of this uh, program and she was here to discuss with us the various issues that they were facing um, and also how as a school they were kind of handling the situation so I would like to uh, thank um, all of the uh, all of those speakers in the take one who had been uh, who had been here and given us a very supportive um, uh, day and today I would also the today's speakers also I would like to thank again Right from uh, Professor Nisha Dewani to uh, Dr. Shrikala, uh, Dr. Pele Mehra, and also uh, Shurabi and Ankit, and given their inputs, which is which would be contributing to the wider society. Um, I also take this opportunity in thanking our uh, head of the department, Professor Mounty, as I always have said that his headship has given us the that direction and also the guidance wherever, whenever we had a hiccup, he was always there to support us. And we had no other issues haunting us. So with his support, I think this webinar was successful. Thank you, sir, for being supportive um, and to complete this program well. Thank you. I also would like to thank our department colleagues, each and every one, uh, right from Gulam Dastigir, sir, Professor Gulam Dastigir, who was here to give the um, 
a lot of thanks from the first day, but also present throughout to help to kind of listen and reflect on the programs. He is not just a listener, but he also always tries to provide um, you know uh, you know feedback as soon as it's over, and so we wait, wait for that as well. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Padita. Uh, who's a, uh, a very uh, is a good friend of us and who's been of this organizing committee and he was there yesterday to coordinate the program and he gave such a wonderful summation of the whole uh, technical session. I'd like to thank him at this juncture. Thank you, sir. I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Mansi who was here yesterday and uh, you know she was part of the program and she's uh, uh, and she again is a very important source of thanks for her department in various ways and especially in the digital uh, uh, scenario her input is very very supportive and uh, thank you dr mansi for that i also would like to thank uh, dr um, mt who again a very friendly who and a supportive colleague and with all of your support only we could get this function going going and i'm sure many of our students will get benefits by listening to the speakers i also would like to thank the, uh, all the other uh, uh, I mean, colleagues from other departments and sister disciplines who have been here, both from within the university and outside the university, who took time to be with us and to this and provide feedback as and when it was required. Thank you. I also would like to thank all the uh, participants who stay tuned for the uh, two days. It's not easy. Initially, we, I mean, we started off webinars, there were many participants, but as progressed, we find that even for webinars, the strengths have come up. But then, despite that, I think, uh, you know, your presence here you know i understand that your keen interest has kept you tuned to this program we thank you for that and we look forward for more uh, interesting presentations with you and uh, we would also get your feedback soon so we would also work on that thank you for that in this uh, list of participants we have a number of our participating, which gives us a lot of happiness when we see our own students coming back listening to us what uh, left this department a few years ago so that's uh, uh, you know give to us and i thank this digital platform for that um, and it is, it's been possible because of that. And as Dr. Desha had already said, but for this COVID, we would not have had these kind of chances. Thanks for uh, this kind of, uh, you know, coming back, helping and uh, being part of this program. Thank you. I also would like to thank um, the Asim Premji Research University, uh, uh, Asim Premji University, for, I mean, university for providing the research grant to conduct a project. And, and this particular webinar is part of a larger, major, larger project which is related to parental involvement in academic performance, or parental involvement, peer group, and academic performance. So it was possible because of that particular project and as it claimed is um, a support. Uh, the team there is all, was also part of this participant group for some time. Uh, thank them at, again at this juncture. I also would like to thank uh, you know, all the rest of the well wishers who have been important in organizing this uh, webinar. And even if not present, their wishes have given us a lot of confidence and support. At this time, I also to thank our university uh, uh, computer center for providing us this, um, you know, important support. Uh, because right at the time when we started working on this, you know, we were doubtful because there was this problem of lesser numbers, you know, uh, that we could only accommodate two numbers, you, uh, you know, uh, YouTube streaming. We wanted to do the YouTube streaming. We also had some uh, technical problems. At that point of time, it was our university computer center who had, been, who had given us all the required support. So I would like to thank at this juncture, um, uh, Mr. Ashok, uh, who is the head of the uh, center, uh, computer center, who had given all his support. And um, and I also would like to Mr. Pin Palnivel, Mr. Balan, Mr. Rasen, all of them for giving uh, the support, also at a personal level, just calling up and inquiring whether everything is online, any support required, etc. So in all that was possible, I would thank immensely the the administrative, uh, the, especially the computer center and their team for giving us this space. Uh, thank you again. Uh, and with uh, a sense of completion and satisfaction, uh, we would end this uh, webinar. So I would also express my sincere thanks to all those people who have been supporting directly or indirectly. And if I have left out anyone in the course, please bear with me. Thank you. And with that, we end this uh, webinar. Thank you all. And we look forward for more such uh, situations. Thank you. And participants, please fill up the feedback form and send it back to us so that we can send you the uh, participation certificates. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm all. sure all this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the Department of Sociology Sir? and also to Social Coordinator Dr. Aruna for inviting me. Sir.
It's very well organized. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, with all the happiness, thank you. And uh, so, shall I end the video? Thank you, Madam Marina. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you all, thank you. Madam, nice program, madam. Fantastic. Thank well you, done, madam. Okay, madam. Bye, bye.